Lloyd, we pray you're blessed, brother. They're here. Let's get into it. Thank you, Sam. Very, very happy to be back with you. I am going to spend time explaining and hopefully proving to your satisfaction and to the audience's okay. satisfaction that Allah is derived from Babylonian moon god worship, that Allah is and was a moon god. Uh, I know this is a contested idea, it's a contested thesis, it is denied and rejected, but I believe we're going to present the evidence in a way that's never been done before, and we are going to show, historically, there is no doubt. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Any thoughts before we go, Sam? Yeah, just guys, don't mind me if you see me walk away from the camera. It's not because I'm trying to be rude to my host. I learned from him stuff I haven't learned before, and I mean that. It's just like I said, I have a cat, and it's not like a dog. The cat needs more attention than a dog. One thing I can tell you, Lloyd, it's a female cat. She reminds me of all the women in my life. Only use me for my food, to sleep, and then dumps me when she wants. So that's the story of my life. But go ahead, brother. Sorry about that, man. Let's 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 hope things change, right? I don't know. I'm 50, so I don't know when they're going to change. But go ahead. Oh, okay. Boy. Well, yeah. So so let's dive in. Um, I've done this series before. I've been working on the slides just to refine them, but I believe we can make a solid convincing case presenting the evidence logically that Islam is Babylonian moon god worship. It goes back. So let's, uh, okay, my slideshow is up. If you want to share that, Sam, then I can go. Right, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned Babylonians because, you know, as an Assyrian, Assyrian son of Asher, we have some times with the Babylonians. Are you attacking my ancestors? But no, go ahead, brother. You can do what you want. <laughs> We're simply just presenting facts. Okay. Okay. And yeah. as you know, in Islam, if you say one plus one equals two, you will be accused of cherry picking. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, anyway, so the series is called Moonotheism, Islam and the Moon God of Babylon. We're going to be talking about Yemen, Ethiopia, Abraham, and a God called al Makkah. Hmm. So if it sounds familiar, well, there might be a reason yeah. why. There is a God called al Makkah. There's wow. a God called al Makkah. Yes. New stuff for me. Wow. Yep. So there is a God called al Makkah, and he was actually, he's the prime, he was the prime deity of the Arabian pantheon. Hmm. He also happened to be the prime deity of the Babylonian pantheon. Wow. Wow. It's good stuff, man. <laughs> I do know, and I know you're going to cover it, Nebuchadnezzar was in Arabia worshiping the moon god when the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medes Persians. So there is that data that Nebuchadnezzar was heavily into moon worship and he went to Arabia of all places. And I know you're going to bring that up, even though this is the first time I'm hearing your presentation. So let's go. Yes, and get it. most okay. certainly. We're going to dig into this in a way that hasn't been done before, because I honestly believe that I know Islam. And look, many people know Islam. and This is not contested, but I believe that I know Islam in a way that, that others do not. I understand I it in a particular way. I agree. I believe that. That's not, okay. and I, I'm not boasting. That's just, just a fact. Okay. So I want you to notice these are very, very old. We, we'll be looking at some very old pillars with these symbols on them, right? These are old religious symbols. You'll notice you'll have a certain crescent. Oh, is that a star in the middle? Oh, a crescent and a star, a crescent and a star. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, these are, these are pagan symbols. So we will look into this. We're going to be seeing much more of this as we go. So the Islamic symbol goes back a lot further than we realize. Okay, so is Islam monotheism or monotheism? Uh -huh. Now, have a look at this picture. You see something that's that's a bit of a connection there, Sam? Yeah, yeah. That's on a minaret, isn't it? Yeah, but now do we see something similar between whatever this is over here? Yes. You see. Moon. If you look online, if you go and have a look, you will find numerous pictures, especially around the Kaaba and around Mecca, of the moon juxtaposed with the Kaaba, the moon juxtaposed with mosques, the moon, the moon, the moon, the moon. It's constant. And there's a reason for that. So we will have a look at that. So this similarities, we, we will cover all of this. We're going to look at archaeology. It's very important to look at history. In fact, if you want to discuss Christianity, it is very important to discuss historical Christianity. You need to go to the history. You need to go to the archaeology because more and more the Bible is being proved. The historicity of the New Testament, the Old Testament are being proved by archaeologists. Things that were 100 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago called fiction are now being proven as archaeological historical fact because the rock inscriptions don't lie. 
So we will be looking at archaeology, history, language, geography, and the Islamic sources. We will show that Christianity was an early arrival in Arabia, although many scholars want to claim this is not because obviously they want to deny Christianity's place in history. Yeah. Whatever way they can. Proto-Islam can be traced to pagan religion in both Yemen and Ethiopia, and we will link Yemen to Babylon. Islam is based on pagan moon god worship. The Arabian pagan deities are copies of the Babylonian Canaanite gods. It is the same pantheon. It's exactly the same pantheon. What they worshipped in Babylon was the same gods that were then worshipped in Yemen and in, in Arabia. Same gods, different names. There is no early evidence of Mecca in Arabia. There is evidence of, sorry, there's early evidence of origins of Islam in Yemen. Sorry, I just finished that sentence and I just said it's a typo. So there's evidence of early origins of Islam in Yemen. We'll look at that. The main Arabian pagan god was called Makkah. Now, in the dialect of Yemen, apparently it was called Makkah. Whereas when it crossed into Arabia, the Arabic there pronounced it as Makkah. Have you heard of a place called Makkah? Yes, yes. Exactly. Hmm. Yes. And we're going to solve the mystery of Makuraba because Muslims like to tell us, hey, you know, um, Mecca is on maps in the second century by, by Ptolemy and blah. We're going to find out exactly what Makoraba is, and we're going to learn about, well, yeah, we're going to solve all of these mysteries. So let's just jump in. Let's talk about a place called Yeha. Ye Yeha is the Sabah kingdom site in Ethiopia. Sabah, you may know it as Sheba, the queen of Sheba. Think of that. And, and Sam, as we go, it also I think it is useful to, to contrast so, some of the Islamic and other pagan ideas we're presenting and, and maybe just to give a brief, just a brief contrast from, from, from the Christian point of view, so people understand what we're dealing with and how Christianity differs and is superior. It's nice, to, I think, to just offer these parallels on occasion, you know, to show people the difference of why we believe what we believe. Right? So, Yeha is a Bronze Age site near Aksum, Aksum in Ethiopia, which is the largest archaeological site in the Horn of Africa, showing African contact with South Arabia. Saba is the historical Sabaean kingdom of Sheba. Kingdom of Sheba. So you may have heard of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon. Mm -hmm. Yeha is the precursor to the Ethiopic Aksumite Empire. Actually, while I'm thinking of something, let me just open up Google Earth so that I have it ready, just in case we need it later. Okay. Now, this kingdom was established in the 8th century B.C., Perhaps a little sooner, but close enough. It includes temple, an elite residence called Grat Belgebri, and rock-cut tombs. Now, what's interesting is that Belgebri means the servant of Baal, the servant of Baal, right? Baal Gebri, the servant of Baal. The Sabaeans were a Semitic people that were from an Arabian kingdom in western Yemen. Their empire flourished from the 8th century BC to about 275 AD when they fell. And the Ethiopians, who then sort of converted to Christianity, then they went across the sea. They settled in Arabia and they dominated the region. So, so there was a change. Now, this temple, oddly enough, is known as the al Makka Temple. Oh. And the Yemeni Q sound, as I mentioned, becomes an Arabic K sound. So the, the softer ka, pa, becomes a ka. Right? So this becomes the Makka Temple. Okay, so briefly then, so this is the this is Najran. Here we've got the Me we've got Mecca, the Kaaba here. This is Arabia in 1846 on this map. This is Aksum. This is Aksum in Ethiopia, and this is Yeha, right? However, across the ocean, what we had here was another Al Makkah temple, a major Al Makkah temple. In fact, there were several. There were several of these. We'll look more and more at these. Najran is important because it was an important Christian pilgrimage site, but also a place where there was great, shall we say, controversy because Gnostics and heretics were, were pushing their gender, their doctrine as well. And this was where there was a huge battle over ideology. I don't mean a physical battle, but ideological battle. Okay, moving on. So let's have a look at who are these Sabaeans, right? These Sabaeans that lived in, the Sabaeans come from this region here, the Hadramaut, what you see here. This is Arabia. That's Mecca here. This was the Hadramaut, right? On the bottom here. Sheba, the queen of Sheba, this area. 
So let's look at the Sabaeans, Muslim perspective. So Muslim writer Muhammad Shukri al-Alusi, who lived from 1802 to 1854, compared the religious practices of these Sabaeans in his Bulukh al-Arab fi Ahwal al-Arab. And he writes, Arabs during the pre-Islamic period used to practice things that were included in the Islamic Sharia. They, for example, did not marry both a mother and her daughter. They considered marrying two sisters simultaneously to be the most heinous crime. They censured anyone who married his stepmother. They made the major Hajj and the minor Umrah pilgrimage to the Kaaba. Oh, wow. Before the Kaaba was around, they went to the Kaaba. They performed circumambulation around the Kaaba Tawaf. They ran seven times between Mounts Safa and Marwa. They threw rocks and they washed themselves after sexual intercourse. They also goggled, sniffed water up into their noses. They clipped their fingernails and removed all pubic hair and performed ritual circumcision. Likewise, they cut the right hand off of a thief and they stoned adulterers. Does any of this sound like modern Islam? Hmm. No, not at all. Nothing. Has nothing to do with Islam. I am so, oh God, you remembered that. I'm so glad. Yeah. As we know, because Islam has nothing to do with Islam. Exactly. So they're talking here about pagans that go back to the 8th century BC. Worshipped a moon god called Makkah. Their practices are nearly identical to modern Islamic practice. Let's continue. From a different author, the Sabaeans have five prayers similar to the five prayers of the Muslims. Okay, that's a coincidence. Just to hear mm -hmm. coincidence. Others say they have seven prayers, five of which are comparable to the prayers of the Muslims. Now, it's interesting that Islam also has seven prayers. They, they allow for two prayers. There's like the mid midnight prayer, I believe, and there's the early morning one. Am I correct, Sam? Yes, I'm, I'm aware of their what they call, it's a technical term. I have a hard time pronouncing super... Yeah, I, yes, just I can't yep. say that. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, one of no, those no. that twists my tongue. Uh, super egalitarian. Yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. With regards to time, they have prayers morning, noon, afternoon, evening, and night. And the sixth is at midnight and the seventh is at forenoon. It is their practice to pray over the dead without kneeling down or bending the knee. As we know, Muslims pray oh. when they, 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 they go on their knees. And yeah, this is not Islamic at all. They also fast for one lunar month of 30 days. They start their fast at the last watch of night and continue till the setting of the sun. Fortunately, Muslims don't do that. Buddhists do, but not Muslims. So this has nothing to do with Islam. Some of their sects fast during the month of Ramadan. Oh, they face the Kaaba when they pray. They venerate Mecca. They believe in making the pilgrimage to Mecca. They consider dead bodies, blood, and the flesh of pigs as unlawful. They also forbid marriage as the same reasons as do Muslims. Now, just to confirm so people know, you're not quoting anti-Islamic literature sources. This is the Muslim sources, a Muslim authority explaining what the Sabians believe. So a Muslim source, volume one, pages 120 and 122, you gave his name. This Muslim authority is telling you this is what the Sabians did and believed. So he's acknowledging the connections and similarities so that someone doesn't say, well, you're just quoting an anti-Islamic uh, you know, Islamophobe, correct? Yeah, no, these are, I mean, these are historical sources, Muslim sources. And I mean, people can go back and say, no, 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 these, these Sabaeans, they, they were actually Calvinists. Here's the evidence. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll wait for it. Yeah. So okay. guys, you caught it. These are Muslim sources. Now, whether the Muslims are right or wrong, he's giving you the Muslim perspective from Muslim sources by Muslim scholars who love Muhammad and they're acknowledging the Sabian practices similar to Islam. So keep that in mind. So continue, brother. Yeah. So luckily we've established there are zero similarities to Islam. Fortunately, yes. Muslims are safe Nothing at this point. to do with Islam. With Islam. <laughs> right. So let's continue. In Bulukh al-Arab fi Ahwal al-Arab, we read the four sacred months, Rajab, Dual Qada, Dual Hijjah, and Muharram, had been considered sacred during the pre-Islamic period, the Jahiliya. Raids, taking revenge, war, fighting and disputes were forbidden during Ramadan. Oh, that's fascinating. If a man were to meet his enemy who killed his father or brother during these months, he would not quarrel with him. During the sacred months, people were under restriction not to fight or make raids and had to remove their spearheads as a sign that they would avoid fighting at all costs. Obviously, Islam borrowed the hallowing of these months from pre-Islamic Arabs and introduced nothing new into the world. From This is the book by Abdallah al-Fadi, is the Quran infallible? One of the Abdullah best. Al Fadi. That sounds like a Buddhist name. Am I wrong, Sam? Yeah, exactly. And by the way, 
this Buddhist that he's quoting, one of the best books written on refuting Islam I have in my library is the Quran Infallible. One of the best books on Islam and showing all the errors and mistakes in the Quran. If you can get it, get it. I have at least two copies of it in my library is the Quran Infallible. But it he's should a be in my Google library. If, if I have mentioned anything, it's very likely to be in my Google library. So just check my Google. It is there, huh? Good. Good, excellent resource. Glory to God. All right. Let's have a look at Al-Maqqa. It's a proper noun. Okay. It is Semitic. It is Sabaean. It's al muq Right. So in the modern Arabic, you, you, there are some versions of the name. It's like al muq Okay. Or el and stuff like that. But this is the Semitic Sabaean here. This is the Ethiopic, Ge'ez. You can see here the languages, the, the writing is almost identical. It's very, very similar. The two are related. Right? So the Ethiopic link, the African link, the southern link here. So he's a moon god once worshipped in Yemen, known as Saba or Sheba, and in Ethiopia, called Aksum. Synonyms to the name are al makka or al muk The Sabaean capital is Ma'arib, 120 kilometers east of Sana'a. So let's have a look here. I... Let me bring this up. So if we go, Sana is here in Yemen. As you go there, brother, brother, I just want to correct this guy. He misunderstood you. Yosef, just say, do me a favor. I insist that people ask the spirit to help them to focus and ask the spirit to help you not to be distracted. He didn't tell you the Sabians were Muslims. You're not listening. Sorry, brother. I have to correct because I tell people, if you're not going to listen, you're not going to learn. So if you're not listening, you're not learning. You're wasting our time. Listen, he didn't say the Sabians were Muslims. He's arguing the opposite, that the Sabians are pre-Islamic, showing that these practices are pre-Islamic, so that Muhammad or Muslims are taking the practices of people that were already, already there, showing you that Islam is nothing but repackaged paganism. Pay better mm -hmm. attention. So, you can continue, brother. Fully agree. So Sana'a is the capital of Yemen today. So this place was a little bit to the east of it. Uh, I, I had to reinstall my computer, so my, my font and sizing, everything is off here, so I'll have to reset that. But what you have is just to the east of Sana'a. Okay, you've got Sirwan, you've got some other places here. So this is where this, it's in this region. The Saban capital is Marib, east of Sana'a. They were a seafaring people. They built great irrigation works, castles, and temples. The British Museum called them the oldest and most important of the South Arabian kingdoms. The oldest and the most important of the South Arabian kingdoms. Sabayan, this is the term here, and in Arabic, they're called Asabiyun. Yeah. They mentioned, except now there's a bit of confusion about the Asabiyun. So, yeah, let's, we'll deal with that later. Okay. So, here we go. Now, notice there's a place called Mokka. What's weird is if you draw a straight line from Mokka to Jerusalem, it goes through Mecca. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do a straight line from here to, to Jerusalem. It goes through Mecca, which is kind of weird, but okay. Um, you know, I just find that, that Mal discovered that because I, you know, I've been talking to him about some of this stuff and I think he picked up. So here's Marib, here's Sana, right, in Yemen, right? So this is the region we're dealing with here. This is Ethiopia, Eritrea. This was all just Ethiopia back in the day. Right. Other al makkah temples dedicated to al makkah the moon god of Saba. This temple measures 14 by 80 meters by 14 meters. Or 40 by 60 by 46 feet, right? Other al makkah temples. Being Sabaean, it is similar to the temples of the Sabah kingdom. Now we're talking about Yemen. It is similar to the temples of the Sabah kingdom capital, such as the al makkah temple at Sirwa and the al makkah temple or Awam temple in Marib. There's multiples of these temples all over. Common religion, major temples everywhere in Arabia. After Marib, Sirwa was the most important economic and political capital of the kingdom of Saba at the start of the first century BC on the Arabian Peninsula. In front of the building, there was a platform that had six pillars. These pillars are mm. called a propylon, okay, propylon. Grat Bel Gebri, the palace I just mentioned, where they have the servant Gebri, the servant of Baal, also mm. had six pillars. Mm. Yeha has been identified as a pre-Aksumite occupation based on 19 inscriptions on stone slabs, okay? Altars and seals founded Yeha, written in South Arabian script. Now, here we have the eight pillars at the Awam temple, right, to al Makka in Marib. Eight pillars. Notice the gaps. What's important here with the eight pillars are the gaps. 
seven gaps, seven gaps, seven prayers. Mm. Because right. when you approach God, you go through the gaps. You walk from the profane through the sa- through the sacred gate into the sacred area, into the haram, right? This is another of the temples. Notice one, two, three, four, five, six. Six pillars, five gaps, five daily prayers. Looks okay. like Kit Kat, by the way. It looks like a Kit Kat bar. You get me hungry from the side, but go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, they speak of this in Himya, right? This is in, in Yemen. It was clearly a royal site under the Mukarabs. The Mukarabs. And probably directly under a king. This word will come up a lot later. on. We'll be dealing at length with the word Mukarab. They said here that the same process which we find in Najran and several towns and so on. The town of Sirawa seems on onomastic, that's word-based evidence, to have early contained speakers of Arabic. The town played no role in Islamic times, they want to tell us, but the site became a great mythic one for Islamic historians. So for some reason, this site was very important to Islamic myth-making. And there was frequent citations of poetry mentioning it. Okay? So here we go again. This is Aksum. This is Yeha. This is Marib. This is Sirwa. They were very close to each other. Right? And that's Najran. So this area, this is all connected. And it goes all the way up to Mecca. Right. Now let's look at the Awam Temple. So we're going to an article by the Smithsonian Institute. Wendell Phillips and his team excavated the great walled enclosure of the Mahram Bilkis, who is the Queen of Sheba. The ancient right. temple of Awam dedicated to the, to the moon god al Makkah. People hmm. will try to say it's got nothing to do with moon gods. It's al Makkah was never a moon god, but okay. Tribal unrest in the area halted their efforts in 1952. Decades later, the government invited Marilyn Phillips Hodgson to continue her brother's work. This is hmm. from the 8th September 2014. Now, I'm going to, the first 20 slides are like an overview, and I'm just going to lay down a few things so you guys understand. So now, here's Mecca. Now, North of this area, right, you've got a thing called the Raja Jil or Raja Lil columns, depending on which source you check. This is the Qumran Caves. Here's Israel. So now we've just had, we've just seen these pillars, right? Now let's go have a look. Why pillars? There must be a reason why pillars, okay? Archaeologists working in Saudi Arabia continue to puzzle over the meaning of more than 50 groups of oddly arranged standing stones, pillars, the most famous of which are found at the site of Al Raja Jil near the ancient oasis town of Al Ju. These date to the Chalcolithic period, which is 4,500 to 3,500 BC. Mm. We're talking six and a half, almost 7,000 years ago. Raised more than five and a half thousand years ago by an unknown people, many pillars are now fallen, others are tilting heavily. They were erected in Saudi Arabia's Al Juf province during the fourth millennium BC. Mm. Now we've got more pillars. There are lots of fallen pillars as well. Fallen pillars. Right? So, Al Juf was a significant stopover point on several ancient trade highways. Trade routes are going to be very important. It connected the Arabian Peninsula, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Syria. Ideas and religious ideas, especially, flowed through trade routes. That was how that was the internet of the day. One so, trade route ran from Yemen through Medina, through Al Ula and Madain Saleh. Notice it doesn't mention Mecca, right? The road avoided the Great Nafud Desert and the less possible terrain of Wadi Sirhan. The stones may have indicated the presence of the crossroad and the safer route to take. The standing stones of Al Rajajil represents an enigma that few have heard of. Hmm. Maybe few that, well, they don't want you to hear about it because we're going to be looking at where these might come from and why they're important. You can see there's a couple more of these. This was very popular. There are 50 groups of these just in that area alone. It's like obelisks. Yes. Now let's have a look at Saudi Arabia again. The Alula, okay, in Saudi Arabia, these are called the Mustatils. Hmm. So... The Alula pendant we'll have a look at. And these are cult and monumentality in Neolithic, uh, Neolithic North, Northwestern Arabia, Cambridge. Okay, So there's a lot of this stuff in terms of antiquity. In antiquity, there's a load of this stuff going on here. Let me just... So they're finding these in North Arabia? Yeah, you'd be amazed what they're finding in Arabia. So this one is from Cambridge. I'm assuming Cambridge is not lying to me about this, but they're finding... We're going to see more of these things. These are all over the place. Okay, So that's the one paper. These are very old. I mean, some of them up to 7,000 years old, which tells you back then this place was very heavily lived in and it was, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'll have a look at another one here. I'm just going to bring this one up for a moment. This is a Google search. You can see there are all sorts of interesting things. Look at this in Arabia. Wow. And they found this in Arabia. Wow. Yeah. 
look at this, okay? So we'll continue here. I mean, you've got even this, these designs in Arabia. You've never heard, you've never seen them. No, okay? I have. Amazing. Similar to Petra, very similar to Petra, right? Loads of these standing stones, loads of these places, a little bit like the Nazca lines of Peru. If you look at this, right? There's, there's, there's some fascinating things going on here that we are not aware of. So yeah, these very old... They're destroying yeah. Islam with these uh, discoveries, but we're not uh, access to them. I hadn't known about these. Okay, so there's more of these designs, right? These these old, old designs. Here's the pendant. Okay, this is one of these sites close up. <clears throat> okay, now, propolons. A propolon is something that is built in front of a gate. A propolon of towers or these pillars you put in front of a gate. They come from propylier, monumental gates or entranceways to a temple or religious complex, a symbolic secular religious partition. So remember, you've got the, the haram, and then outside of that is what is profane. So you've got the holy area, the haram, and you have to go through the gate to get to the haram. So the Century Dictionary Encyclopedia tells us in ancient Egyptian architecture, and last week we spoke about the hermetic influence in Islam from Egypt, which is not very well known, but how they actually have... Hermes Trismegistus, this pagan god, also known as the Egyptian god Thoth, as part and parcel, as, as an actual supposed prophet of Allah in the Quran. The second prophet in the Quran is, they call him Idris. Idris right. happens to be the Egyptian god Thoth. That's right. Yeah, you mentioned that. Right. So yeah. we'll briefly touch on Egypt again. So ancient Egyptian architecture. So the Egyptians used to use these little gates, these pillars, to separate between... So you have two towers in outline like truncated pyramids and chambers, 20th century dictionary, monumental gateway before the entrance of an Egypt, ancient Egyptian temple. So these ideas, these, these pagans are borrowing these ideas from Egypt. This is an Egyptian pagan idea that has made its way because these religions back in the day would freely mix and share ideas. And so there was a, a lot of mixing going on. It wasn't as static as, as we would like to think. Now I want to show you this building, I believe is this is either the entrance to Disneyland <laughs> yeah. or uh, Sam, can you recognize this? I'm having a difficulty. Yeah. Well, I mean, the entrance to Disneyland is more realistic than what you just po uh, posted here in Jerusalem. Is this where Muhammad had a magical ride? On a <laughs> Could be. This is. Yeah. So he, so I want you to notice though, look at this, this monumental gate. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Okay, one, two, see. three. Look at these gates. There are four of these around this building, and there's not only one here. Sometimes they're just before the entrance, these pillars before the entrance. Wow. Okay, there are four of these around this building. Okay, there are four of these, one on each side, which separates the sacred from the profane. So you have to enter through these symbolically to get into the haram, right? So this is actually derived, this idea is derived from Egyptian pagan religious architecture, right? And of course, you've got this link to Hermes Trismegistus, right? So Amazing. moving on, Axum was one of the four great powers alongside Rome, Persia, and China, and you've never heard of it. And this is according to Mani, the founder of Manichaeism. It had influence over Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Arabia, and Egypt. It had extensive trade contact with Asia and the Mediterranean, and the Aksumites developed Africa's only indigenous written script, Ge'ez. Mm. Right? This is one of their stele, one of their pillars. They made these... these like an obelisk, huh? Yes. So this was something they made. Now, Sabaeans in Africa, right? They speak of the realm of Aksum, also part of Eritrea, right? There were Sabaeans in the Horn of Africa. The evidence is a, is a number of inscriptions which make it clear we have to do with genuine Sabaeans holding to the national cult of Al-Muk, al makka right? Notice they, they're missing the vowels here. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so some remarks on the origins of the Aksumite stele. So the first section is like 20 slides. Okay. So this, a lot of scientific papers I'll be quoting. The purpose of this paper is to investigate the origins of the Aksumite stele in the light of Near Eastern and African megalithism. Why, why do we come to the word megaliths? Well, if you look at Stonehenge, scholars have actually realized 70 years ago that the Kaaba originally would have had a lot to do with Stonehenge because it also was a megalith. Right, which we'll get to in the end. So they speak of the third millennium BC. They found in the Negev, okay, that Bab Dedra in Jordan, okay, and they speak of a sanctuary devoted to the ancestor cult in Riske in southern Jordan. So what you've got is you've got stele, these little pillars, go back 
the whole of Arabia from, from, from the area we now recognize as Israel, from Jordan, southern Jordan, all over the place. And this is all based on ancestor cult worship, other pagan practices. So pillars were common everywhere. Okay, of a circle, 20 meters in diameter, of stone slabs carved with schematic male and female portraits. Okay, now we've got stone circles. Now we've got them in Arabia. We've got them all over. These are all everywhere. Okay, let's continue. The Aksumite, you can pause, you can interrupt anytime if you want to make a comment or ask a question, Sam. Yes, yes. I'm just, in, I'm just interested that your sources say 4,000, 3,000 to 1,000 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want people to pay attention. Third millennium BC, fourth to first um, century millennium BC. That means this, this is thousands of years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind, brethren. All of this is even before the time of Jesus Christ, let alone before the time of Muhammad. Yeah, St. Demetrius says there's so many similarities between Mani and Momo. And yes, that is true. So, and we will talk about Hagar and Ishmael at length as well. That's all coming. So, I'm just putting down some pieces. We're going to tie all the threads together. So National Geographic. The Aksumite Empire was a wealthy trading nation in Northeastern Africa, achieving prominence in the first century, unifying and controlling a large territorial state and access to trade routes linking the Roman Empire to the Middle East and India. It introduced Christianity to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So the Aksumite Empire went from paganism to Christianity. Archaeologists have found evidence of a complex society called Diamat or Dimit that preceded the rise of Aksum by several centuries, based in Yeha, which we just opened with, Yeha in Ethiopia. Okay? It was strategically positioned at the crossroads of trade routes from the East African coast to the African interior. Trading partners included most of the major states in the known world, Egypt, South Arabia, the Middle East, India, and China. Mm. These wow. people traded everywhere. Ideas yeah. flowed through these trade routes. Their most important commercial partner was the Byzantine Romans, mm -hmm. of all things. Okay, let's have a look. The Axum Empire controlled more than this, but their trade routes. These guys controlled territory all the way up until Mecca. At one point, they militarily controlled this. They not only financially, culturally, but also militarily at one point controlled all of this region. If not, some say all the way up to Petra. Wow. This is phenomenal stuff. Wow. Okay. So remember, India, China, Greece, Rome, these guys were everywhere. So their trade routes went land routes, sea routes, and they went on the left-hand side, not the right-hand side okay, of the Red Sea. Now let's look at some coins. Axum was the first African country to mint its own coins in gold, silver, and bronze in the standard weight categories of the Roman Empire. These coins had been recovered in multiple foreign locations as far away as India, and also, they were the very first Christian kingdom to put crosses on coins. Let's have a look. So notice, here we've got crosses on the coins. Amazing. Okay? Cro crosses on the coins. They were the very first kingdom to do so. Now, these guys became Christian as early as the first century. They formally became a Christian nation very early on, and they were dominant in Arabia, as far as Mecca. So they spread Christianity to Mecca very, very, at least to Arabia, to supposed Mecca very early. So these are coins that predate Muhammad. And you can clearly see these are Christians because of the crosses. And yes. so because they had this influence and control of the trade route, they are now evangelizing and spreading Christianity even into Arabia long before Muhammad. Yes. Wow. You guys, We're going to learn more about that. Yeah. Archaeological coins don't lie. There you go. Crosses symbolizing the death and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Beautiful. That's so amazing. let's continue. So moon worship. The Aksumite ruler was called the Nagusan Agast, the king of kings. King Azana ruled from 320 to 360 AD, converting to Christianity as verified by the Aksumite coins. He had coins with pagan disc and crescent. What, hold on. Do you know of a religion that has a moon hmm. and a star? Hmm. No, nothing to do with Islam. So we have found coins before they were Christian that clearly show their paganism. But then later on, we see they convert to Christianity and worship Jesus Christ, huh? Yes. Beautiful. Really? Wow. Amazing stuff, brother. Woo! I well, like it. These later coins have crosses on them. But notice... Now, do you remember, Sam, you must have heard the story that Muslims keep telling you. Well, you know, those nasty, nasty Ottomans, you know, 
they yes. decided that the crescent and the star would be a great symbol for Islam. And, and it's only from the mid 1800s that exactly. they decided. And it's really only a popular symbol since then. It really, really honestly. Yeah, yeah. exactly what well, they said. It has nothing to do with Islam, it has to do with the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, but, but you see the Ottomans, but somehow this symbol goes back to, to hold on, now, now we're looking at 800 BC. Right? The crescent and star symbol as a religious motive goes back to pagans who we will see worship the Babylonian moon god, Sin, as early back as like 800 BC in that region. Okay? So, they converted, right? Now, from these coins with the crescent and star, he then he was the first Christian king to put crosses on currency. He then changes and he starts to put the cross on the glory currency. to Jesus Christ, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A nation that's pagan converts to the <clears throat> true God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amazing, amazing. Yes. Wow. So let's yeah. talk about Ethiopia now. This is going to be a tad controversial. I'm not going to get into this too heavily, but Ethiopia, according to the latest research is the first Christian state, even older than, um, uh, what's the, the Armenia? Yeah, Armenia, I was going to say Armenia. So even before Armenia. Apparently, the, the evidence that's coming out now seems that they became a Christian state even before Armenia did. But we'll talk about that. So Axum became the first sub-Saharan African state to embrace Christianity. King Azana proclaimed Christianity state religion in the early 4th century. For a century prior, Roman traders had brought knowledge of the Christian religion to the Axumite mercantile network. These trade networks are critical in the day. Remember, this is the internet of the day. In the 6th century, the Aksumite king Caleb sent a force across the Red Sea to subdue the Yemenites, dominating South Arabia for 70 years. The Byzantine emperor supported Aksum largely due to Yemen's persecution of Christians. Okay. Now let's have a brief look at the first church in sub-Saharan Africa. All this evidence, we will start to bring this, weave this all together. A church in Northern Ethiopia rewrites the history of Christianity in Africa. Archaeologists can now more closely date when the religion spread to the Aksumite Empire. And we'll have a quick look through this article. Okay. Also, there was a 4th century Assyrian church discovered in Jubail, Saudi Arabia. So let me just go across. Assyrian? The... Wait, 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 bro. You can't skip over that. I'm Assyrian. These are my ancestors. I'm the sons of Asher. So they found an Assyrian church in eastern Saudi Arabia? Yes, I've been to Jubail. I've actually been a lot. I've been over quite a bit of Saudi Arabia. Assyrians, did you hear that? I'm sorry, man. I got it. You know, we, we poor Assyrians, we need attention. We're neglected. Assyrians, 4th century AD. An Assyrian church, church established by Assyrian Christians who love the Lord Jesus Christ in East uh, Saudi Arabia or East Arabia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby. Here it is. So this is it here. This is the church here. Wow. So this is the remains. Uh, let me just go there and see if I can find this. So unfortunately, we're not going to see much of this picture, but this is the, it's the, just the very tiny remains of this church that exists here. So this is the area here. This is Jubail. I've been to Jubail, did some work there. So this is on the East Coast. Here, Dubai around here, Oman. And this is Jubail. And this is Qatar. I've been to Qatar like 20 times. I've been to Bahrain a couple. Did some work out there. So this is this area here. And this is a, a Syrian Christian church right here. In Jebel. Oh, My brother, just to help, help some people who want to pontificate and pretend they know, you just showed some pre-Christian coins from the Aksumite Empire. On their coins, they had a crescent moon and a star, correct? Yes. Okay. Because you see, you have some people in my comment section. I don't know. Is it me? Maybe it's my looks. We attract people who think they can pontificate their know-it-alls. They like to pontificate in the comment section, but they don't have the guts to start their own channel, present their own data or debate. So supposedly before they became Christian, it was Judaic as if they couldn't go from being pagans to embracing Judaism, to embracing Christianity. This is why I block people. I have a virus called blockalitis. I just want to let you know. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, because the crescent and star is, as you know, it's a, it's a Southern Judaic. It's a Cleveland Jewish symbol. It's the Cleveland Jews. Yeah, the exactly. Cleveland Jews. <laughs> 
Yeah, man. So we got to send bye bye to Yusuf. Yusuf, uh, take your friend, and you know, I'll we'll go fund me and take a flight to Ethiopia where you guys belong. Don't come back here. Get the ladder, yeah. guys. Okay, go ahead. So I mean, as you know, the Crescent and Star. It's I mean, it's it's very easy to confuse it with Buddhism or, or Southern Cleveland Judaism. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. It could be Islamic <laughs> because, as you know, Islam has nothing to do with Islam. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> So, so look, so the first section, we're just going to establish some history. The first 20 pages, we're just establishing history. And I'm on page 14 or whatever. So this is from the Smithsonian Magazine. Now, remember, I, I told you I don't believe everything I read. I'm very, I try to be very careful. So this is from Smithsonian. This is in fairly new. It's like three years old or so. The oldest known Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa, discussing early conversion to Christianity in the area, in the region, it would go on to dominate Western Arabia. In the 4th century AD, about the same time, an emperor Constantine legalized Christianity. Now, this is when they became, when they formally declared the state Christian, but the country had been Christian for a couple of hundred years by then. Like wow. Christianity had got there very early already. They confirm Ethiopian tradition that Christianity arrived at an early date in an area nearly 3,000 miles from Rome. The new religion spread through long-distance trading networks that linked the Mediterranean by the Red Sea with Africa and South Asia. Again, trading networks comes up all the time. Aksum was one of the world's, world's most influential ancient civilization, but remains one of the least widely known. It's incredibly powerful. They ranked it with Rome and China, but wow. no one's heard of it. They served as a nexus point linking the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire with distant lands to the south. They traveled by boat, donkey, and blah de blah de blah. And here again, we see crosses. There's the cross. And just so people understand, he's quoting Smithso Smithsonian Magazine. They're not a yep. pro-Christian magazine. And one of the people quoted from John Hopkins University. These are not Bible-believing Christians necessarily. It's, it's a magazine that's simply stating the facts to the best of their ability from what they are discovering through archaeological excavations. Yep. So Ethiopia remained defiantly Christian even as Islam spread across the region. And of course, today, nearly half of all Ethiopians are the members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhid Church. The word Tawhid, like you said in the previous session. Yeah, the, the Tawhid, though, the Tawhid, though. The word Tawhid, it means unified, unity. And this is where the Islamic word, the Arabic word Tawhid comes from, from the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhid Church. This refers to the unity of God, of the Godhead. So... Nothing to do with Islam, certainly. Nothing. You are deceived because you're not part of the Gnostic circle. Come on. Yeah, so it was home to temples built in a Southern Arabian style dating back many centuries before the rise of Aksum, a clear sign of ancient ties to the Arabian Peninsula. Okay, the temples reflect the influence of the Sabaeans who dominated the lucrative incense trade whose power reached across the Red Sea. And then they speak of a massive building, 60 feet long and 40 feet wide. Very similar to what the building we discussed previously that mm. was found in Yemen, right? The, the same dimensions of the temple, 60 feet long, 40 feet wide. The same dimensions exactly as the previous building. Right? Because these temples had a particular dimensioning size to them, I, I believe. So very, very fascinating. But also this was taken over and was made into a church. And they found a diverse array of goods from a delicate gold and carnelian ring with the image of a bull's head to nearly 50 cattle figurines, clearly evidence of pre-Christian beliefs. These bull's heads and these horns are going to be very important. We're going to see a lot of that as we go. So evidence of pre-Christian beliefs. They found a stone pendant carved with a cross and incised with the ancient Ethiopic word venerable. Might be important. I don't know. Then they came across an inscription asking for Christ to be favorable to us. Mm. And they said this unusual collection of artifacts suggests a mixing of pagan and early Christian traditions. Yeah. Repeat that line, last line again. This, this unusual line. collection of artifacts suggests a mixing of pagan and early Christian traditions. No, man. They oh, were Judaic. Do you, you understand? Smithsonian is a lie. These overzealous Ethiopians that we blocked and sent back to Ethiopia are going to tell you they were Judaic. There was no paganism. My goodness. Oh, yeah. Christ be favorable to us. Christ is the he's the Baha'i God. No, no. Hold on. He's the Buddhist God. No, no. You know, you know what's crazy is Buddha was an atheist, and then now Buddhists worship him. Hey, like I tell you, you're not in part of the Gnostic Ethiopian group. These guys are part of the Ethiopian Gnostics. 
So go ahead, brother. Okay, so this is the ring that they mentioned with the bull's head and the horns. That's very important. You're going to see, yeah, well, I mean, we, we're, going to, we're going to learn more about that. Okay, so the spread of Christianity was intertwined with the machinations of commerce. Fascinating. Religion spread through commercial networks. The cosmopolitan nature of the settlement, a glass bead from Eastern Med, large amounts of pottery from Aqaba in today's Jordan, attest to long-distance trading. We're going to see this come up again later, and it's important. And the discoveries show that long-distance trade routes played a significant role in the introduction of Christianity in Ethiopia and other religions. These routes developed and their impacts on regional societies. So these trade routes had impact on societies. The Aksumite Kingdom was an important center of the trading network of the ancient world. Okay, that much is established. What do I have here? Okay, so that's all established. So let's move on. <clears throat> the first hijra in Islam was the migration to Abyssinia, what we call Ethiopia. Muslims found refuge in Christian Aksum, Ethiopian Eritrea at about 614 AD. When the apostles saw the affliction of his companions, and though he escaped it because of his standing with Allah and his uncle Abu Talib, he could not protect his followers. He said, go to Abyssinia, it would be better for you, for the king will not tolerate injustice, and it is a friendly country. Remember we said mixing of these religions? Thereupon his companions went to Abyssinia. This was the first hijra in Islam, according to Ibn Ishaq. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So in Arabic, Al Hijra like, is Ila Al Habasa, Habasha, Habesha. Habesha is Ethiopia, where Muhammad's followers, the Sahaba, fled. The word Sahaba also you can find in oh. the Ge'ez, in the Ethiopic. The word oh. also comes from there. Fled the persecution of the ruling Quraysh tribe. The Aksumite king received them, is known in Islamic sources as the Negus, the Najasi, right? Some of the exiles returned to Mecca and they made the 622 Hijra to Medina with Muhammad. The rest remained in Abyssinia until they came to Medina in 628. They stayed there for about 14 or 15 years. Yeah. Right? Amazing. Now, it's very interesting that a lot of the practices of the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Church, the Tewaheddo Church, actually made its way into Islam, like leaving your shoes outside and the women sit on one side, men on the other, because they have a very Judaic influence in their Christianity. It's a very Judaic, Messianic, Jewish slash flavor to it. Okay, I'm going to skip this story completely because they claim that the king became a Muslim, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just for people don't know, he's quoting Muslim sources where Najashi supposedly testified he believes what Muhammad said, but he tried to cover it and hide it. But yeah, that's garbage. But yeah, yep. it is. Well, what it is. Okay, so let's have a look at some Ethiopian links to Islam. Okay. The Christian community in South Arabia at Najran. So let's have a brief look. Where is Najran? So let's go back up here. That's our church. We'll leave that behind. <clears throat> so we showed earlier, this is Mecca over here. This is Najran here. There was a large Christian community in Najran, right over there. Okay. Mm. This is Mecca over here. This is the rest of, of Yemen and the major sites there. Okay, moving on. The Christian community, which was perhaps the oldest Christian community in Arabia, and his persecution by the Jewish king, they call him Jewish for maybe what, who knows how Jewish exactly he was, but whatever, is mentioned in the Quran, appears to be in a mixed community. There's no doubt that many of them were Nestorians, okay, heretics of the day, while others were monophysites, more or less related to the monophysite yeah. church of Abyssinia. Now, we need to understand this context of, of course, this history with everything. So back then, the monophysites, today they are not seen as heretics than they were. Today, the, in fact, the whole argument seems to have been historically one of terminology. They meant the same things as the Orthodox churches of the day, but they used some different words to describe it, yes. and there was a dis disagreement. This was before the, the terminology, the, the Nicene Creed and the other councils had agreed on fixed terminology, set terminology to describe Christian concepts like the Trinity. This led to arguments, but let's just say back then they were considered not orthodox, they were considered heretics, and they may well have been in some sense. In some sense, today this has all been this has been sorted out. They're part of the orthodox churches. There was a big fight with another dude. We'll get into that another day. So, in international trade, Abyssinia was the destination of one of Qusay's four sons, who, according to Ibn Habib, was Abd Shams. Trade relations between Mecca and Ethiopia went back to the late fifth or early sixth century. So these Muslim sources acknowledge this, but we know that this area, they, the trading goes back to BC times, right? Okay, so Arabic, now also the word Arabic injil, just out of interest, just one of, Arabic injil resembles the Ethiopic word wanjil. Yeah. Arabic word injil resembles the wanjil. 
The word had already been introduced into Arabia by Abyssinian Christians at the beginning of the 6th century. The generally accepted origin is Greek, euangelion, good news, but unfortunately that's not a really good, not, not a good source for this word, injil, which entered the Arabic via the Ethiopic wangil. According to Arthur Jeffrey, the long vowel ending in wangil, like the long second syllable of injil, is a closer resemblance, closer than the Syriac. Let me emphasize that for people who are not, maybe not paying attention. Pay attention to what the brother is saying. He's going to show you a lot of Ethiopic terms. Pay attention, brethren. So I want to just hammer by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of us learn these facts and absorb them and share them because I'm learning tons of new stuff. What he's telling you is some of the terms in the Quran related to Christianity, like in Gia, come from the Ethiopian Christian terminology. So here, Injil, Arabic term for gospel, is similar to the Ethiopian term, Wanjil. And this is something noted by scholars of Islam, Arthur Jeffrey. Arthur Jeffrey was considered one of the greatest scholars on the language of the Quran and all of the foreign words found in the Quran. And we have his research on answering Islam.info. So notice, he's going to now be showing you Ethiopian terms, Christian terms used by Ethiopians, finding their way into the Quran. Keep that in mind. This is from Arthur Jeffrey's book from his 1937 survey, from his 1938 book. You can see Ethiopic lends over 200, ultimately it's over 200 words into the Quran. So 200 words that are Ethiopian origin are in the Arabic Quran? Yes, at least, at least 200. Even though the Quran is supposed to be pure Arabic, are you sure, you heretic? You're well, not, not, see. look, I, I don't want to confuse you with the fact, Sam. Oh, all right, that's that's okay. Good. But certain. notice, according to Arthur Jeffrey, PhD at Cairo University, he mentions fifty-five languages that are in the Quran. Now, oh. now I can only count to twenty. To count to eleven, I've got to take off my socks on one foot, and then, you know. <laughs> I can get to 15 if I take that sock off, you know, yeah. and then, but, but this is 55. This is more than I can count. No, but these, these languages took from the Arabic Quran. So you're getting your facts all mixed up. The Arabic Quran is eternal. So these languages stole these words from the eternal tablet. By the way, here's the link to our website, answering.islam.info. And we have Arthur Jeffrey's books there. So take advantage of all these free resources that God has blessed you with. And support men like this brother prayerfully and financially. They're a blessing to the church. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah, so another Sy Syriac Aramaic, consider that one language. Okay, effectively consider that one language. And then Ethiopic and Amharic, consider that one language. That's close enough for our purposes. And if we do the survey today, we would find even more words. Because more work has been done. But yeah, World War II, World War I, all that stuff just got in the way of a lot of research. So let's let, we're just throwing things out there. We're going to start tying threads together. But Abyssinian... Okay, Ethiopian, philologically, Ethiopic, the ancient language of Abyssinia, is the most closely related to Arabic of all the Semitic tongues. Ethiopic and Arabic with the languages of the South Arabian, blah, blah, blah. But notice, it is the most closely related to Arabic of all the Semitic tongues. Would that be significant, Sam? Most definitely it would be significant because it ties in all the threads. The Aksumite and ancient civilization powerful that rivals rome becomes christian and you see its influence spreading to arabia of course these threads tie in perfectly glory to jesus christ for the research that he's allowed you to discover yeah so let's continue so from the ancient gears okay so these contacts as a matter of fact were fairly close which is we're talking ethiopic contacts gears contact with arabia right so for some time previous prior to the birth of Mo, the southern portion of Arabia had been under Abyssinian rule. Mecca was saved from the Abyssinian army, the year of the elephant. We're going to be talking about that little elephant story. Okay. And there were trade relations between Abyssinia and Arabia at a much earlier period than the Aksumite occupation of Yemen. Friendly, friendly relations continued in spite of the year of the elephant. And Muhammad sent his persecuted followers to seek refuge in Abyssinia. Meccan merchants employed a body of mercenary Abyssinian troops. And an army travels when, when, the, when they conquered that region. The army obviously would have taken its clerics and its Bible with it. These guys were there from the 270s onwards, 280s, right? Which means that by the 3rd century, 
the Ethiopic Bible, and we know that Muhammad supposedly quoted from the Ethiopic Bible. He listened. Muhammad spoke two languages. They were Arabic and Ethiopic, mm. according to Islamic sources. Mm. And yeah. he's, there's so many links to, we will talk about all these links. Okay. His first nurse was an Abyssinian woman, Um Ayman. The man he chose as his first muadhin in Islam was Bilal al-Habashi, Habashi. Oh, yeah. the... Tradition already noted the Prophet was particularly skilled in the Ethiopic language. And what did they say in the in the whole Quran and all that? Muhammad and, and so on in the Islamic sources, Muhammad would listen to two Abyssinian brothers recite the Bible right. every day. Exactly. That's yep. Yeah. Hey, guys, and if you can find that, I have a link where it's the exposition of chapter 16, verse 103, Jalalain and others mention. The names of the two Christians that Muhammad would frequent. In fact, I'll bring up the link. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. So he's giving yeah. you what Muslim sources are saying. Yeah. These are Muslim also sources. the Bible from Ethiopia was in Ge'ez, right? Now it was never translated into Arabic that we know of, but it was preached, and then it was paraphrased into the Arabic. So not word for word, but paraphrased into the Arabic. This would also give us some grounds for believing why the Bible was misinterpreted or misunderstood by the Arabs. I'm okay, getting the, that's section one done. Any comments, Sam, before I go on? No, this is, brethren, I'm telling you, I'm not just saying to say it. The stuff you're getting, you don't get in colleges or seminaries. Ask any Christian who's gone and studied Islam on an academic level, meaning, <clears throat> let's say, a Christian going to a college or seminary. He won't get <laughs> this stuff. So this is stuff that you need to be thankful for and uh, praise the Lord for, but then you need to do your part. Study, understand the fact, share them correctly. Don't misinterpret, misunderstand. Pray for the men that God is using to feed you and be a blessing to them to support them financially for ministry because some people are called to ministry and he's one of them. So brother, I just want to encourage them because a lot of people don't understand what you're giving. It's not accessible. You got to really be in the upper echelons of academia to even know this stuff because even in Bible colleges and seminaries, they're not going with this level of depth on Islam and how it's a hodgepodge of Christianity and paganism and Judaism. So we appreciate you for that. Well, thank you, Sam. I mean, really, it's high praise coming from you. I really appreciate it. I mean, sure. I, I grew up on the internet watching Sam Shamoon and so on and so on. So for me, thank you. Um, okay, so we've laid out a few things. We've shown connections. We've shown these historical links. And we're going to flesh all of these out, tie them all together. So Islamic symbolism, the pagan crescent moon. Okay, this is the Hilal, the crescent. Okay, the Hilal is the crescent. That little crescent moon, right? When you see the crescent moon. Right. Ah, Jabir and Yasser, the Quran. This, speak. this. So, yes, yes, yes. I'm giving you the link. I'm going to send it to you in private chat. Here it is for you. So, guys, I just gave you the exposition of chapter 16, verse 103 of the Quran. They, they tell you who these Christians were that Muhammad would listen to. Here it is. Jabir and Yasser. And the Quran says that they spoke a foreign tongue. They were not speaking Arabic. Confirming what our brother just said from... The Muslim sources. So there you go. Right. So this crescent moon you see here, the crescent, you know, and also when you, we, the picture I opened with had that little slice of the moon, that little bright white slice of the moon. That is known as the Hilal. Hilal happens to be somebody's name. That somebody happens to be a pagan god called Hilal, who happens to be the crescent moon god. But that's probably just a coincidence, right, Sam? That's right. Nothing to do with Islam. The fact that the Muslims call this the Hilal, and Hilal is a crescent moon god, a pagan Babylonian moon god, it's got nothing to do with Islam, right? Nothing to do with Islam. No, of course not. This is Islam's symbol, the crescent moon called the Hilal. Let's continue. Let's have a look at the influence that this crescent... Remember, I opened with this pagan symbol that goes back thousands of years of the moon and the star. And on some occasions, it's the moon and the sun, but it's the moon and the star. Let's have a look at this pagan symbol the flag of Algeria, the same pagan symbol we saw that it was in Yemen. Let's have a look. Mauritania, Somalia's got the star. Let's have a look here. Okay, Syria's got the star. Tunisia, the moon and the star. Morocco, this looks to me a little suspicious, but okay, we'll get into that. Okay, the Arab League, the moon and so on. Let's, let's have a look at this. So the pentagram is Babylonian pagan. It is the symbol of the gods Ishtar and Marduk. Mm. Now, understand that these gods were gender fluid you go to a different geography you go to a different time you go back 50 years go forward 50 years go back 100 whatever the case might be 
the god Ishtar might be called the god Frank, okay, who's male, but then he becomes Sally if you go back another 50 years, right? And he's female, and then you go back another 50 years, you go left 50 kilometers, and then he's called Jonathan, and he wears, yeah. he wears pants. So understand, the, these things were a little, it's, it's, a me, it's a mess, okay? But Ishtar and Marduk, sometimes they're the same god under different names at different regions, or they're just different qualities. Like the, the one group might have the god, the god of water, and the other one is the god of, I don't know, apples. Because yeah. this is, because the one group needs water, so they pray to the same god, but they, they see him as the god of water, and the other one needs apples, and they see him, they call him the god of apples. So it's the same yeah. god, just different qualities they're naming got that yes if i if i just to sum up what you're saying what you're saying so people understand a god worship in one region that god will be associated with let's say fertility but then that same god in another region will be let's say associated with the sea it's the same god but depending on the location that god will either be identified as a god of fertility here let's say in arabia but then in Iraq, he'll be identified as the god of the sea, but it's the same god. And sometimes, oh, the god of god the god male. of farming or something like that. Yeah. Yes, and a god that's male in one region ends up becoming female in another region, but it's the same god. One feminized, the other masculinized. So I got the gist. I just want them to get what you're saying. Yeah. And in fact, even between tribes, tribes would 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 look at one aspect of the god, and then, like for instance, like you might have one group calling Jesus the savior. And another one calls Jesus the Lamb, right? So you have the yeah. Church of the Lamb and the Church of the Savior. They're not separate gods. They're not two different religions, yeah. right? Yeah. So the pentagram is Babylonian pagan. It's the symbol of the gods Ishtar and Marduk. The red symbolism, symbolism here is from the imams of Yemen. Yemen is going to come up a lot, okay? Red is from the imams of Yemen, who are very important, but okay. And the pentagram is the seal of Solomon. The pentagram is the seal of Solomon. It, it also happens to be the symbol of witchcraft my goodness the demonism the satanism that's inherent in these religions and islam is mind-blowing so this is a symbol in witchcraft huh yeah this is the satanic pentagram yeah why is why did they attribute it to solomon so okay short version I don't so I'm not really... that's a future we can talk about i just was no, curious but i can give you the short version the short version is the queen of sheba so they're associated she's associated with solomon Right, Queen of Sheba and Solomon. Yes. So when they learned about the Queen of Sheba, she was a Sabaean. Remember, the Muslims were Sabaeans according to that Islamic source, right? Yes. So they assumed that Solomon was also a Sabaean pagan. Wow. So they thought that. Oh boy. So the tradition is Solomon, because of his association with the Queen of Sheba, ends up becoming a Sabaean pagan. One yeah. shout out, brethren. <coughs> Nailer. One shout out, I'm glad he's here. This is the first time I've seen my channel. He's the brother I spoke to two days ago on God Logic's channel. He was duped into becoming a Muslim three weeks ago. But wow. God, glory to God, he became a Muslim three weeks ago. But glory to God, God Logic spoke to him and I spoke to him. And now he's reconsidering Islam and he's reconsidering coming back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Trenton Naylor. Hope also became a Muslim and now returned to Jesus Christ and he worships Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So welcome, Trenton. Trenton, stick around because I like to talk to you later. Right now I can't. So focus and learn because you're going to learn the true satanic, cultic, pagan roots of Muhammad. And this man is a giant for the glory of Christ. So go ahead, brother. Well, thank you. Let's continue. So the Hilal, the crescent, this is Islam's symbol. The Egyptian hieroglyph for month features a crescent above a star. It is a remnant of a lunar calendar. Notice the little eye symbol as well. Okay, the evil eye, whatever. The symbol has spiritual significance in ancient Mesopotamia. You would know that as Babylon. The Babylonian cuneiform word ship to or incantation. Oh my, incantation. Didn't we say that the, the magical, fragmentary, unknown secret letters of the Quran were used for incantations? Yes. That's right. right. Nothing Originally, to they took a form very similar to the modern star and crescent, and it was apparently used to ward off evil. Oh, to ward off evil. That's why we have the evil eye. So this is the earliest hieroglyph here from the Babylonian symbol. Okay. The crescent star. Then you go back to 4500 or 4300 BC crescent star. Then you go to this cuneiform method here, and then you go here to 600 BC. This symbol goes way back. You're looking, this symbol goes back at least 7,000 years. 
oh, right? Wow. And we're going to say this is very important to Islam. Huruf, Akhruf, Kamatria, exactly. But the Muslims had their own version of that as well. So, and um, I mean, what one could say, obviously, if you look at the book of Deuteroscopy, it speaks very strictly against magic. But the, the rabbis obviously went off the rails by embracing magic. So, I mean, this is. I like what you call Deuteroscopy. That was nice. <laughs> Yes, we, I caught that one. <laughs> um, yeah. So this boundary stone of King Nebuchadnezzar from the from Babylon, this is Nebuchadnezzar the first from Babylon, eleven twenty five to eleven oh four BC. This is like three and a half thousand years ago almost. Contains a star within a crescent. Look over there, crescent and star, Babylonian. Oh, no, it's it's got nothing to do with Islam. Fortunately, fortunately, we know this. It's got nothing to do with Islam. There were symbols associated with the deities Shin. The moon, sin, oh my, my sin, oh my, it's shin, shin, sin, the moon, and Ishtar, Venus. These names are going to start coming up a lot. The moon god. Now, people say, well, you know, in, in Greece and Rome, the sun was the biggest deity, the major deity, you know, the important one, and therefore it's the same in all other places. That's not true. In so, Babylon, the moon god was the major deity. The moon so, god was the major deity, and the sun was his wife, his consort. And they had children. The children were the stars. So it was reversed. Now in Babylon, the moon is the major deity, not the sun. The sun is his wife, the, the, the number two on the totem pole. Right. The same happens to hold in Arabia. The moon is the main god. Exactly. The chief deity. 100%. So, the Hilal. Yes, Sam? No, I'm just saying 100%. I want people to understand that they'll tell you the sun was a prominent deity. In certain cultures, other cultures, Arabs and Babylonians, it was the moon. Moon, sun was the concert. Keep paying attention to what he's telling you. So let's have a look at this little symbol here. Here we see it again. The symbol is found in the Parthian Empire. So this is what the Parthian was before the Sasanian, before we had the, the Iranians, right? On the coins of Phraates the fifth, the star, this is 2 BC. The star represented either the Zoroastrian divinity Mithra or the divinity Tishtria. Zoroastrian, mm -hmm. that's another story, for a long, a long story for another day. The star and crescent became an emblem of the Parthian kings and was adopted by the rulers of the Sasanian Empire. In the Sasanian period, the star and crescent is shown with explicitly Zoroastrian elements that worshipped fire. Well, some will say they did not worship the fire. They worshipped in the presence of fire. Right? Mm. So, the star and crescent is shown with explicitly Zoroastrian elements. Coins display a portrait of the king surrounded by the symbol. Here you go. One two, three, there's like four versions of the symbol right there around the king. On the reverse is a depiction of the fire altar with attendants. When Muslim Arabs conquered Persia in the 7th century, Sasanian coin designs were preserved. Reformist Caliph Abd al-Malik replaced the fire altar scene with Arabic text, but kept the stars and crescents. Hmm. Hmm. And the symbol then later starts appearing in Muslim art. See, so they, they liked some of what they found. Some of that paganism stuff that was crunchy and good. So they kept it. Why they didn't get rid of it? Because, you know, it's got nothing to do with Islam. I don't Same. know. Um, it's pure monotheism came down from heaven. It's just haters like you. It has nothing to do with Islam. It's what you just said. You just said it was pure borotheism taking from pagan yeah. or astronism. Yeah. Now you know you have hidden knowledge because you understand the symbolism between my terms you're doing gematria on my words the secret like word you said I, yeah because i i heard i translated the word it's borotheism <laughs> you're a special kind of gnosis <laughs> you're a special kind of gnosis my friend <laughs> so the crescent is it ottoman or is it pagan or what is the audience saying what does the audience think of this guys am i making sense so far if you read the, oh. uh, the comments you've blown them away they still haven't recovered from the previous sessions right now what you just showed them, they're like in a coma state. You haven't been looking at the comments. So what you basically said is that the crescent moon and the star only originated from the Ottoman Empire. And all these archaeological inscriptions, these are all lies created by the Illuminati to deceive you. The, the Illuminati Bigfoot Alliance. Yes, sir. So you got it. Yeah, so that's what it is. Because all, Bigfoot's so invisible. You can't see him. That's right. Because people claim he's there, but no one's seen him. So he's <laughs> able to go places and plant the coins. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. Islam's over. The days of Islam is over. Glory to God. So, so, so guys, it's the Illuminati Bigfoot Alliance. And I mean, so why are we at this? Um, I mean, look, I'm just going to throw this. Call me a conspiracy theorist, okay? Ulama. Ulama. 
Oh, yeah. That's why you're a special kind of Gnosis, sir. <laughs> and by the way, ulama, that refers to the Adam, the one who has knowledge, and ulamanati, besides sound like my favorite pizzeria, Illuminati pizzas, it means the illuminated yep. one. You'll, Get into that know. another day. So, okay, so the Christian Muslims say, well, you know, it's actually just, it, it goes back to the 1850s to the Ottomans. You know, the Ottomans were a little bit naughty, you know, they were a little bit naughty. <laughs> Nonsense. So, let's have a look. This, let's have a look at this, St. Demetrius, thank you. Okay, so let's have a look. This is Baal Haddad, just otherwise known as Baal. He's got a little, oh, crescent thingy and a little little round thingy there. Okay, the pagan Byzantine coins. Okay, this is from the Byzantine period. Doesn't mean the Byzantines were pagans, but uh, here you go, crescent and star. Uh, then, of course, then you've got the Hittite crescent moon. Oh, the Hittites. As you know, those were friends of the Jews in the Bible. They were good guys. You got the crescent and the star. Okay, well, well, fine. This is Haran, Turkey. Haran is very important, but that's that we'll get there. Haran, Turkey, crescent and star, crescent and star, crescent and star, crescent. Okay, fine. Crescents and stuff. So Muslims claim it is the symbol of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Others say it is a pre-Islamic moon deity. Religious symbols are historically and theologically significant. Bear this in mind: any religious symbol is historically and theologically significant. The cross is linked to the crucifixion of Christ. It is logical that the crescent moon is thus historically and theologically important in Islam. Would you agree, Sam? Yes, glory to God. hundred percent true. And it's ironic. You've taken this to such a higher level. Just guys, give you a little history. The research he did ends up vindicating the late Dr. Robert Morey. Robert Morey passed away several years ago. He wrote a book called Islamic Invasion. I'll show you the book in a minute. He found some evidence that the Allah of pagan Arabia was the moon god, but he wasn't able to go to this level of depth and provide such overwhelming massive amount of textual archaeological data. So in two debates he had with Shibrali, they really tried to discredit him, attack him, humiliate him, saying he's a fraud, the sources don't support it. So you, by the grace of God, have taken it to such a higher level that if Robert Morey were alive today, he'd kiss you on the head and say, thank you, because what I saw in the 90s, you now vindicated because you took it to a whole higher level that he would be salivating if he could have this information. So you vindicated him for the glory of Jesus Christ. Thanks. I appreciate that. I, I, I read about that a little bit, and I, it struck me as like, you know, there's a story here. There's, there's, there is something here. Anything that I say can be further explored. I'm touching on some topics. I'm just introducing it to say, look, there's evidence to believe this. At least here's evidence for consideration. If not ultimate proof, but there is evidence we cannot simply sweep under the rug and ignore. So yeah. a lot of this can be expanded upon. And thank you for that, Sam. So Islam claims to be the original true monotheistic religion. We need to understand how they mean that. The religion of Abraham. So Islam claims to be the original religion of Abraham. Short version of this story, and we will cover this more in depth. Abraham is a pagan, and according to the Jews, according to the oldest and most detailed scholarship of the Jews, Abraham was a Sabaean. The same Sabaeans we opened this whole series with, those Sabaeans from Yemen, that was the religion of Abraham and of his family. He was a Sabaean pagan moon god worshiper. He then leaves, he joins, he becomes a Yahwist. He follows Yahweh. He's the first Yahwist, right? Yep. And of course, he destroys the, uh, the, the pagan idols, etc., in his father's store, and then he founds Judaism. He founds the, the, the line of the Jews, right? Am I more or less correct, Sam? No, 100%. That's, that's exactly. He comes from pagan roots, and this is also, just to tie it in, in the Jewish tradition, it says that Abraham destroyed idols, idols that was being fashioned by his people, and he got in trouble, and that's picked up and quoted in the Quran. Oh, that's, yeah. We'll that's talk boring. about that. Yes. Uh, we, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the fictional story they wrote there, but that's going to be funny. That's a joke for later. But basically, they want to go back to the... Now, remember, Muslims reject Judaism. They reject Christianity. They reject them both. And we're going to look at their, their own evidence, their own sources on this. So what they say is, no, 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 no. Christians got it wrong. The Jews got it wrong. They're all liars. The Bible's all been blah, blah, blah. We need to go back to the original religion of Abraham. Remember, they reject Judaism. So if Abraham was not a Jew, then... The Jews tell us Abraham was a Sabaean. His father was a Sabaean. His family was Sabaeans. Exactly these people that we're discussing now, these Sabaeans, these moon god worshippers of Babylon, this was the religion of, of, of Abraham. 
So Muslims say, no, no, we have to go back before he became a Jew, which is this religion. Understand, yeah. this is checkmate for them. I mean, they don't understand, but Abraham is a major issue for them. The story of Abraham is a major problem for them. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they, they claim to be the true monotheistic religion. Okay, we'll talk about it now. Hanif, the word Hanif, plural, Hunafa. Okay, like Kunafa, dessert. Okay, maybe I got that wrong. In Islamic writings, it is one who follows the original and true monotheistic, quote, religion. In the Quran, Hanif is used especially of Abraham. Yeah. Later Islamic usage occasionally uses Hanif as the equivalent of Muslim. Hanafiya is the religion of Abraham or Islam. The Encyclopedia of Islam tells us, some of these authors are blatant, right? They'll say, well, you know, Jesus never existed. Or they'll say something really stupid. I mean, blatantly polemical in an encyclopedia. You're like, how did that even get past the editors? But whatever. So at least in the Muslim belief, the Hanafiya is Islam. Abraham was a Muslim. Understand that. Okay, this is very important. Hanif, we're going to look at this word. It will come up more than once. Hanif in Arabic and in Hebrew, this Arabic masculine name, meaning righteous person or true believer. Remember Hanafi, right? The one of the founders of the four schools of fiqh. Yeah. Yeah. It is generally agreed that Hanif is derived from the Syriac word Hanpe, meaning heathen or pagan. And that's in my language, by the way. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> in Assyrian today, when we call someone... <laughs> Pagan, we call him Khempa. Khempa. That's exactly where it comes from. Brother, I just want to confirm what he's saying, because I speak Syriac, which is an offshoot of Aramaic. In Aramaic, even at the time of Abraham, I'm mean, not Abraham, the time of Muhammad today, the word Khempa, and there are Syrians here, that means a pagan, an idolater. It doesn't mean a pure monotheist. So there you go. So now notice that Hanif originally meant and remember, Syriac is one of the major sources of the words in the Quran. Exactly. So what we suddenly have is, let me just go here. So don't forget, according to the encyclopedia, according to Muslims, Hanif means someone who is upright, someone who is a good follower of Islam. Well, according to this, they're pagans, they're heathens. That's right. So like, okay, you know, only one of those can be right. Muslims claim that Muhammad's religion goes back before Judaism and before Christianity, before we went astray. Biblically, before the laws of Moses, right? I mean, basically, that's what they're saying. But notice, biblically, according to the Christian belief, according to the Bible, before the laws of Moses, we had the seven laws of Noah. Now, before the conspiracy theorists go yeah, ape. Yeah. You're, you know where you're going, yeah. The Noahite. Oh, my God. No, just, just please stop. Please stop. So that's on the same. It's, there's a word. Push it for that. Okay. <laughs> So before you start, you know, give me that, just, just, just stop, please. Okay. The seven laws of Noah, just for those, because look, once you've proven them wrong, they'll just make up another lie to cover it. But very simply, before the 10 commandments or the 10 statements, before Moses came with the 10 statements, you had the seven laws of Noah. These are derived to some degree exegetically from the Bible. What you have is that five of the laws of Noah are word for word, literally the 10 commandments. So of these, so these seven laws preceded the Ten Commandments that Noah got. So the laws of Noah, five of them are in the Ten Commandments. So for those idiots, and I'm trying to be polite here, those idiots who claim that the seven laws of Noah are satanic, you need to explain to me how five of the Ten Commandments, and these are Christians making these claims too, by the way, Christians, quote unquote, you need to explain to me how five of the Ten Commandments are satanic. How 50% of the Ten Commandments is satanic if five of them are in the laws of Noah. And the other two that, and this is a longer story for another day, the other two are to establish courts of justice. And I believe the one is not to eat, no, no, not to eat things that are yes. raw, not to eat raw meat and drink blood. Yeah, that's blood. It. So Let how me, is it? Sorry, Sam? No, I just want to hammer what you're saying so people don't misunderstand. Understand the difference between what is in the Bible, because the seven laws of Noah are in the Bible, and what lay, people do with it later on. You can take something that's in the Bible, and you can pervert it and run with it. So don't misunderstand him. He's not talking about what's today called the Noahite religion, which some rabbis encourage Gentiles to follow to reject Jesus. It is as a fact. The seven laws of Noah are in Genesis. His point is, and this is something, if you read the Bible attentively, you'll see. And I don't mean to cut you off. I just want hammers to get it. His point is, a lot of what you find codified later by Moses 
was already known and observed long before Moses, even before Abraham. For example, when Noah comes out, he builds an altar and he offers burnt offerings to Yahweh. That means the concept of burnt offerings predates Moses. So what you find later on is a codification of commands already known to people by God, even during the time of Noah. That's all he's telling you. So keep that in mind. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, and people try to make all sorts of false claims about this, and it really upsets me. I've done a long series on this. I mean, this is just like they're trying to undermine the New Testament. This is how they try to undermine the foundation of the Old Testament. That's that's all it is. Yeah. Okay. So so now biblically, we know that before the Ten Commandments, we had the seven laws of Noah. So why didn't the Muslims then adopt the seven laws of Noah, right? Which is basically seventy percent of the Ten Commandments, effectively. They didn't do that. They went pagan. They go pagan. Okay. So. Yeah. Hanifan, not uprightness, but pagan. So now they like to claim that if you go to Quran 10, 105 as one example, okay, this says, it says here, be steadfast in faith in all uprightness and do not be one of the polytheists, okay? I mean, Muslims are polytheists because they pray to these poles, but we're going to get to that as we go, but in uprightness. So the one to claim here that Hanifan means upright. Now, literally, when you say upright, they mean upright pillar. Mm. okay mm. it is not so it is not uprightness it is pagan basically be upright like a pagan pillar we're going to talk about that this word is upright now they, they remember we've just seen that hanifa is supposed to mean something else but here we see it is upright but the context of what upright upstanding well well what stands up those pillars we saw remember we saw those pillars in the beginning those big standing pillars we're going to start looking more at that so be steadfast in faith, in all uprightness, and do not be one of the polytheists. Uprightness. Now, why did they? Why is it showing to be upright here? But it's up. It's a different word, different meaning in another place. Okay, fine. Confusion. Maybe they're confused. Okay. So now we can see upright. So this is from the website Quran.com. Okay. So we'll skip this. HNF, the root Hanif, pagan, non-Islamic sources in Jewish midrashic literature. The Hebrew root Hanif is associated with heretics. So even in the Jewish sources, this word, Hanif, is associated with heretics, people who've deviated from the way of the Bible. Okay, the word they have is Menim. And in Syriac documents, Hanpa, okay, plural, Hante, denotes non-Christian pagans. This complicates the etymology of the Quranic Hanif, which retains the sense of one dissociated from Judaism and Christianity to the quote-unquote pure religion of Abraham. But since they reject Judaism, and they reject the seven laws of Noah. Therefore, they've adopted the pagan beliefs of Abraham before he worshipped Yahweh. That's Christian amazing. apologists of the early Abbasid period retained the pagan sense of the term, and they applied it to Muslims in an attempt to demonstrate the derogatory aspect of the title Hanif, by which Muslims call themselves Muslims call themselves Hanif. Remember, now I'll give you a parallel. Christians were called Christians, okay, as a derogatory term, followers of Christ, by people who didn't like them. Christians went, well, if the shoe fits, wear it. So Christians and Jews were calling Muslims pagans. And the exactly. Muslims went, yeah, okay, we'll go with that. Your let, thoughts, Sam? Let me emphasize what you're saying. Brethren, I'm confirming what he's saying because as an Assyrian, I speak Syriac. The time of Muhammad, in Syriac, the word khampa, as the scholarly sources confirm. You see, he's giving you scholarly sources that aren't Islamophobes. The word khampa, from which you get Hanif, meant pagan and in the writings of the christians who wrote in syriac aramaic they would call muslims khempe, meaning pagans absolutely spot on continue brother yeah so so guys yeah, i mean are you am i making sense and um, so absolutely. from from the audience I, am i being logical consistent am i making sense does everything seem to be like i mean this is academic stuff right so yep like okay, this guy so it's ironic. Like you, it's ironic. They adopted a term that said they're pagan, and they t why, wear it as a badge of honor. Ironic. Correct. And they reject the Bible, and the people, and the early Christians, and the Jews of the day were saying that you guys are pagans. You guys violate the Bible, and they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're good with that. The pagan sense of the term was known to Muslim writers who applied the title Hunafa to such pagans as the Sabiyun. Now, the whole the Sabaeans were also called Hunafa. Oh my, oh my. Hmm. Oh, that, that's fast. They were in the same category as the Sabaeans. Isn't that odd? By Masudi, Tandich. And this comes from Luxembourg. 
Okay, see the Sabians. Now, the Sabians and the Sabaeans, okay, they're different, but close enough for now. Al-Yakubi describes as Hanifs, the pagans who worship the stars in Saul and David's times. Oh my, oh my. They worshipped the stars. Even Yakubi, a known Islamic scholar, says that Hanifs worship the stars and we are Hanifs. Isn't that a little odd, Sam? Yeah. Uh, wow. Glory to God. Uh, this is amazing stuff to destroy Islam. Wow. Yeah. So, so let me go on for a little bit. Okay. So the word Hanif in the Quran. Okay. The Quran is the holy book of the KKK, just for those who are wondering yeah, why I I'm studying it. It's a <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Okay, yeah. just so you know, the the you guys have heard of you guys may have heard of a little group called the KKK. Their holy book is called the Quran. Just so, by the way, that's why I'm putting that in there. Just just so you know. Okay, back to this. Now, the word Hanif is used of Abraham as pure worship of Allah, contrasted with idolaters, mushrikun. That would be you. Okay, if you're not a Muslim, you're a mushrikun, right? Let's just let's just close enough, right? But they are Hanifs. They worship. Now remember, they reject the Bible. They reject Judaism. They reject Christianity. So they are worshiping Allah. And in this context, Allah is an astrological God, an astrological deity. In fact, they're in the same category as the Sabaeans. Am I making a correct logical connection here, Sam? Absolutely. Guys, pay attention. If this is a religion steeped in the astral worship and the pagan... <clears throat> practices at that time he's now setting forth the case that allah is one of these astral deities and you know where he's going with this focus the evidence where it's pointing to focus yep so it asserts that abraham was neither jew nor christian and that the people of the book were originally commanded to worship god as hunafa not as the polytheists and idolaters we are today we're not idolaters because idolatry has a particular logic to it. I just released a video this week called The Logic of Idolatry. Christianity cannot be called idolatry. Idolatry goes against the Bible. Idolatry, uh, can I do a brief diversion on idolatry, Sam? Yeah, in seconds? fact, now I do a brief idol uh, div uh, diversion. Like I said, we can do this regularly and cover all the topics. And you can end after the series with polemics. But I want you to first establish the pagan influence. So, yes. And then come okay, back. Yeah. So, so briefly speaking, right. just as a, okay, I'm planning to do a series to tackle like three common Muslim arguments against Christianity and then to really hit them from an angle they've never been hit before in a way they've never considered. But briefly speaking, idolatry goes against the God of the Bible. So idolatry, the whole purpose, the whole logic of idolatry is to take, is to create a house for the God, a symbol, a statue that holds him. And then you localize, you fix that God to that place, to that local space. Okay, that idol is not the God itself. The God is something separate, but he's now localized in that space. God is not, cannot be tamed in an idol. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. But also to have an idol, you have to do a ceremony to make the idol alive. You have to do what's called yeah. the opening of the mouth ceremony. This goes back to ancient Egypt, of course. This is where this practice comes from, right? Now, obviously, so you have a stone and you put the God into the stone I wonder, do there is there a place in in you know is there another religion that has a stone where where God is present? Is that... No, you're just hallucinating. Just because there is a, a black cube and a black stone in Mecca that the Muslims venerate, you're just hallucinating. There's nothing <clears throat> going on there. Don't listen to the man behind the curtain, sir. Nothing to do with Islam. So so Allah is not localized in a box. In, in a, okay, fine. Sorry, I was confusing nothing. myself with the facts again. Exactly. No. <laughs> Let's look at the Al, the people of the book, Al Al Kitab. The people of the book are the Jews and Christians, and later extended to Sabians. Sabians? Oh my golly, people of the book, Sabians. Now, these Sabians are not Sabaeans. Get that right, okay? There's the Sabians and the Sabaeans. The Sabaeans are the Yemeni worshippers of Al Makka, okay, the moon god, right? And the Sabians are actually someone else, okay? But there's a lot of confusion between the two. The Quran deliberately causes confusion between it. I, th I don't think it's an accident. So the Sabians, we'll find these are guys are in Turkey. They are in Haran. And these are, you'll discover these are serious Gnostics, big time Gnostics, anti-Christian. Okay. Very, very much against Christianity, but whatever. But, but, and Muslims borrowed from their religion and they, they thought this was real Christianity because they reject biblical Christianity. And Zoroastrians, we've just discovered, oh, they're coins and they took the moon symbol and they took, remember the, the whole on the Zoroastrians. 
a Zoroastrian link. Isn't that okay? These things are all tying together now. Let's continue. Abraham in Quran 367 was not a Jew nor yet a Christian, but he was true in faith and bowed his will to Allah's, which is Islam, and he joined not gods with Allah. So before Abraham became a Jew, he worshipped Al Makkah. We're going to look at that. They say, become Jews or Christians if you would be guided to salvation. But say thou, nay, I follow the religion of Abraham, the true. He joined not gods with Allah. Well, the religion of Abraham was moon worship, as we know, even from the Bible. Hanafia is contrasted with polytheism and the corrupted monotheism of Jews and Christians. So most claim was that Abraham was righteous before he followed Yahweh, before Judaism was founded. Yeah, these facts are hurting, man. It's like, Sorry. yeah, I, I know. I was... I have a small brain. I shouldn't let it out a lot. I should, you know. Yeah. So for a time, the Hanafiya was actually the name for Muhammad's religion, was actually historically a name for Muhammad's religion. But the name has changed many times for many reasons. We'll talk about all of that. Abraham was Hanif Muslim. Now, oddly, technical use of Muslim and Islam started only at the end of the, of the second of 2AH. Okay. Oddly enough, the term starts a bit late, but we're not going to, we don't have to jump into that too heavily. But I just call it ha ha nafia, ha 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 nafia. Okay. <laughs> Let me on that last yeah. quote. I want them to explain what you just said. According to he's calling, he's quoting a renowned, outstanding scholar of Islam, Richard Bell's introduction to the Quran, and his entire book is on our website. I'll give you the it's link. It's also in the Encyclopedia of Islam. Yes, yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, so you so now he's an outstanding <laughs> scholar of Islam. He's not an Islamophobe. You hear, understand that last quote, brother. Please listen. Listen to what he just said. The term Muslim and Islam only started being employed by Muhammad's followers or Muhammad 2H. Now, if you don't know what 2H means, the second year after Muhammad migrated to Medina. This is why I want this brother to take his time with this stuff because I feel like he may think that he's dragging. No, take your time. Understand what you just read. The term Muslim Islam only became employed by Muhammad and his followers the second year after he went to Medina. That means from 610 all the way to 624 AD, they didn't call themselves Muslims or use the term Islam. Keep that in mind. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, they were, they were Hanafiya. And we've just established the Hanafiya is the religion of Abraham before he became a Jew, which, as we know, was Sabaean moon worship the Babylonian religion. That's what Abraham followed. So then they went, oops, that's a bit on the nose. Uh, time for a rebranding. So basically, I mean, these guys are snookered. They just don't know it yet. So the word Hanif in Islamic literature, even Hisham occasionally uses Hanif as equivalent of Muslim. Okay. More frequent is the, is the use of the word Hanafiya for the religion of Abraham, which is Islam. Okay. We are going to have to look at the religion of Abraham at some point and see what was this religion as well. The form tahannuf means the adoption or the practice of Islam or the exercise of the quote-unquote true faith. Oddly enough, the word tahannuf means penance, okay, which seems to be a Christian borrowing. All right. Now, let's look at the use of this. How long should I go for another 15 minutes, Sam? It's up to you, brother. I mean, you're the one. It's your time over there. I don't know how late it is. You can do a part two as well, but it's up to you. But there's probably going to have to be five parts to this. To be okay, no, on. that's good. So you can come and do the part two next Thursday, God willing, but I'll be in another state if God wills. We'll continue. But yeah, you take as much time you want for this session. Yeah, this is lengthy and it's it's detailed and it might need explanation. So I people, yeah, it, it's a lot to take in. Yes. So let's see its use in the Sira, this, this Hanafiya. Let's look at this word in the Sira, right? The Gospels of Mo. All these uh, these biographies from Guillaume's Sirat Rasulala, the life of Muhammad. Okay, <clears throat> so Salman the Persian told the apostle that his master in Amoria told him to go to a certain place in Syria where there was a man who lived between two thickets. That's yeah, a man yeah in Syria between two thickets. Does is that address familiar to you, Sam? Hmm. Man between two thickets is that in what Syria? And Syria. It could be a guy on a corner in in a guy on a corner in Bolivia. It's about as accurate as that, but okay. <laughs> every year, as he used to go from one to the other, the sick used to stand in his way and everyone he prayed for was healed. Okay, wow. so this guy was a Christian healer. Okay. 
And he said, ask him about this religion which you seek, for he can tell you of it. So Muhammad is looking for the original religion. They didn't know. what, what they, We've got this fake Judaism. We've got this fake Christianity. We need to find Abraham's original religion. Okay, let's go looking for it. So they went north, south, east, west. They went looking. The people came to this man with their sick, and everyone he prayed for was healed. And then he eventually approaches the guy, and he said, I said, Allah, have mercy on you. Tell me about the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. And this man replied, you are asking about something men do not inquire of today. The time has come near when a prophet called Mo, spoiler, will be sent with this religion from the people of the Haram. Remember, the Haram is the pyramids, Egypt. Go to him, for he will bring you to it. Oh, Muhammad will bring you to this religion of Abraham. Then he went into the thicket. The apostle said to Salman, if you have told me the truth, you have met Jesus, the son of Mary. Did you guys hear that part? Guys, did you hear what he just quoted? Salman the Persian, supposedly looking for the true religion, met Jesus on earth in Syria. Jesus was still on earth during the time Muhammad appeared as a prophet. So Salman spoke to Jesus because Jesus was still appearing in Syria and he would heal people because he's caught. He's a man between two thickets. And Jesus told him, You'll find the man with the true religion of Abraham in Mecca. And so Muhammad said, if what you told me is the truth, that was Jesus who spoke to you. You, you saw Jesus and met Jesus. Yep. <clears throat> Jesus said, Momo will bring you the true religion of Abraham. So Jesus was on earth, but I thought Allah took him to himself. What happened, Lloyd? Dude, you're uh, so confused with the facts. I, I am. I, I don't know. I, I'm going to have to work up a new vocabulary to respond to these things. So... <laughs> So the Hunafa, Christians in Syria and the Hejaz, what are the sacred roots of Islam and the, and the uh, planned modern Islamic society by Jamil Efara? He's a Buddhist. You can tell by the name. Okay. okay. They speak here of Ben Malik. And this word Malik is going to come up a lot. We're going to run across this word a whole lot at some point. Ben Malik. Fine. Christians of Syria used to call the Nazarenes of Bani Israel the Hunafa, plural of Hanif, an Aramaic term that denotes the, def the deflection the desertion, basically, of that group from the true Christian religion of the Syrians. Oh, so wow. these Nazarenes, now, there's about 14 groups historically called the Nazarenes. But, but anyway, for the purposes of the Quran, when they speak of the Nazarenes, they're clearly not talking about Orthodox Christians. And I don't mean the Orthodox Church. I just mean people who believe Orthodox Christian doctrine. Like, you know, the, the basic story of Jesus, you know, died, risen, all of that stuff, right? The Trinity, yeah, at that time, yeah. These like people this. are obviously non-Orthodox, heretics, in other words. So these Nazarenes of the Bani Israel, the Hunafa, were called heretics. So the word Hunafa was ascribed to heretical Christians by the Syrian Christians. Wow. Now, let me uh, emphasize what you read again. This is uh, amazing information. So you see the word Nasara in the Quran. You see, it's making a tie with Nasara. That term is describing particular Jews. And you find the church fathers mentioning the Ebionites, the Nazarenes, some were more Orthodox than others. But you see the Christians who held to the Trinity, Christ being God in flesh, called these Jewish groups that would deny the deity of Christ because there are certain Jews that believe that Joseph sired Jesus, so he wasn't born a virgin. They called them Hunafa as a derogatory term, emphasizing their heretics. So the term was used by Christians for these heretical Christian groups, like the Nazarenes calling them heretics. And yet Muhammad adopts it as the name of his religion. And he mentions the Nasara in the Quran. Make the connections, brethren. So. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. So, so I'm just trying to provide corroborating evidence of the things that I'm saying to show that, that these are all connected, these are all linked. All right. So we've got this. Now let's continue. Guillaume, the life of Muhammad. Now there are four men who broke with polytheism. If in case you're wondering, you're a polytheist. Right. And they said that they were seeking the Hanafiya. Okay. Find for yourselves a religion or by Allah, you don't have one. So they went there several ways in the land seeking the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. Okay. And Waraka attached himself to Christianity. Okay, fine. He was a full Orthodox Catholic. I had no doubt. 
actually, no, 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 sorry. The original religion, Christianity was founded in 1387 by a guy called Martin something. But, hmm. but that's a story for another day. <laughs> yeah, Martin Luther so, did. Come on now. So Dude, anyway. Ottomans, brother. You're getting from you. Ottomans sure. and the Christian movement. Come on, see. You, you can go. see I'm very confused. It's, it's, the, it's yeah. African education. So yeah. Sam, it's, okay, so Ubaidullah went on searching until Islam came. Then he migrated with the Muslims to Abyssinia, taking with him his wife, who was a Muslim, Um Habiba, blah, blah. When he arrived there, he adopted Christianity, parted from Islam, and died a Christian in Abyssinia. Okay? Fine, 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 and fine. Zaid had determined to leave Mecca to travel about in search of the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. And then he went forth, seeking the religion of Abraham, questioning monks and rabbis until he had traversed blah, 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 and Mesopotamia. Then he went to the whole of Syria, and he came to a monk in Balqa. This man was well instructed in Christianity. He asked him about the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. The monk said, you are seeking a religion to which no one today can guide you, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And so on and so on and so on. Now, okay, hold on. Sorry, this is a very similar retelling of that story. He will be sent. This prophet, Muhammad, will be sent with the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham, so stick to it. Well, he's about to be sent now, and this is his time. Now, Zaid had sampled Judaism and Christianity and was not satisfied with either of them. So they reject those. So now let's talk about Abraham, how Islam treats Abraham. So we know we've got, we've got a guy called Isa. He's the Gnostic Jesus. Now, I, when Muslims say to me, well, we worship Isa. We love Isa too. I'm like, the Gnostic Jesus. Because, and they go, no, 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 no. I'm like, you do realize the Christology of Isa is entirely Gnostic. I mean, you say that he made clay birds breathe life into them. And this is from a Gnostic text from anywhere from the third to the fifth century. So these are Gnostic stories. Well, why are you telling me about Gnostic Jesus? Yeah. And Muslims yeah. don't like that. Use that on them. Anyway, but moving, moving on. Now let's think how they how do they treat Abraham? So Abram was his original name. He was called the Ivri. Okay, Ivrit means Hebrew, and they in in Arabic there's the word Ifrit. We're gonna have a look at that. Abram the Ivri, the Ifrit, the Hebrew. Abraham the Hebrew. It means to cross over from the other side. Okay, it also means Ever descendant. So to cross the river perhaps. Okay, or to cross to from one place to another it could be a metaphorical crossing, to go from one religion to another right, yeah. from one state to another, or a descendant. So Abraham received news that his cousin Lot had been taken away as a prisoner of war. A fugitive brought the news to Abram, the Hebrew, or Avram Ha'ivri, Genesis 14, 13. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew. This was his original name, okay? So that's in the Bible. Biblical scholar Naum Sadna concluded that Hebrew was really an ethnic designation akin to Canaanite and Moabite. Theories abound. By the time of King David, 3,000 years ago, the term Hebrew had largely disappeared. For most of recorded history, the descendants of Abraham, the Hebrew, were just known as Jews. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, the word Cthonian, of or relating to the deities. Okay, Cthulhu. You might have heard of H.P. Lovecraft, Cthulhu, Cthonian. Of yeah. or relating to the deities, the spirits and beings dwelling under the earth. In Greek mythology, Cthonian refers to beings that inhabit the underworld, considered to be the dark shadowy counterparts of the Olympians, okay? Mm. Evil gods, gods who live underground. Let's have a look at the Encyclopedia of Islam and what the word ifrit or the plural afarit means in, for, the, for the Muslims. It's an epithet, a name expressing power, cunning, and insubordination. It occurs only once in the Quran in the sense of rebellious. It means a class of particularly powerful jinn, basically, Chthonian forces, formidable, and cunning. In the popular tales, the Ifrit is a jinn of enormous size, wow. formed of smoke. It has wings, haunts, ruins, and lives, and lives under the ground. Okay? It may be used of humans and also people. That's fine. So now, what happens is that they call... Sorry, I'm missing my point here, but <clears throat> Abraham is... Um, 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 uh, okay, so basically, Ifrit... Uh, okay, so what they've taken is, so Abraham is the Ivri. What the, what the Arabs have done is, they've taken the word Ivri, the Hebrews, and they've turned the Hebrews into an insult, into jinn. Mm. So Abraham becomes, in the Arabic, the Ivri. The Ivri is the Ifrit. The Ifrit, the Ivrit is the Ifrit. So now these are people who were rebellious. They, they are equivalent of jinn, demons, bad gods, bad what, spirits. Mm. You see what they've done to Abraham here? Effectively, yeah. it's, a, it's a sideways yeah. insult. 
Yeah, let, let me hammer it for them. I'm sorry. I don't, I, you're doing a phenomenal job, but I want to repeat it for all of us. Okay, so you guys saw the word Hebrew in Genesis describing Abraham. It's pronounced Evri. Hevrit. So what the Muslims did to insult Hebrews, basically insulting Abraham, was take the term Hevri, Arabicize it into Ifrit, a humongous, giant, demonic spirit, a genie. And he's even mentioned in connection with Solomon in chapter 27. So you see what he, he's, he's showing you? How they're demonizing, demonizing these terms associated for the most part, with the Jews. Ibrahim, Abraham, Hivri becomes Ifrit. And Ifrit is a derogatory term. It's much like what you have the nation of Islam doing when they call the Jews, right? Blonde hair, you know, blue eyed devils. Make the connection mm -hmm. what's happening, the demonization. Yeah. So, so I hope I Yeah, thanks it. for pointing that out because sometimes I don't explain things as well as I could. So it's great to have another perspective. No, you did. I mean, I got what you were saying. So that means you're doing a good job. I'm just emphasizing it so people don't just overlook it because you're covering so much information i want them to catch these nuggets so i'll do a couple of slides more then i'll finish tonight okay so why abraham wasn't christian or jew so now understand that this sentiment these ideas they got from the gnostics okay you just so confirmed negative my, sentiments. sorry brother i don't mean to cut you off so you just confirmed i got your point because look what you're quoting yes no solid solid okay. so Okay, so this anti-Jewish sentiment the Muslims got from the Gnostics, okay? Because we've already established before last week, Islam is Gnostic, all right? Now, Abraham was not a Christian or Jew. So there's this idea to try to say Abraham wasn't a Christian or Jew, blah, blah, blah. Let's go to John 8, 44. This is important for the Gnostics. Ye of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Right? When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he's the father of the lie. Okay? This is John 8.44. Now, what happened was the Gnostics twisted this verse. They tried to twist the original Greek. All right. So before Islam, pseudo-biblical Gnostics also reinterpreted the Bible. I mean, they still do today. John 8.44 has been a source of their hostility to Jews and Christianity, claiming it is a pro-Gnostic verse, with Jesus affirming that the Jews serve Basically, Satan, Yaldabaoth, okay, the Gnostic version of, of the, the, the devil. So, anti Semites make the same claims while ignorant of its historical source, right? They seek to undermine the passage and legitimize their stance by asking if John 8 44 reads, You are of your father, the devil, okay, or you are of the father of the devil. Jesus says to the Pharisees, remember, he's not talking to all Jews, he's speaking to a particular group of people. Exactly. Those are and he's saying, enough. you are of your father, the devil. But the Gnostics and the Muslims, and, and the, indirectly, historically, they, they twisted it to say, you are of the father of the devil. <laughs> right? So, so understand, so modern scholars persist in the semantic game. You are of the father of the devil. So if the Jews are of the father of the devil, then the God they worship is even worse than the devil. And if they worship yeah. Yeah. Yahweh, exactly. Yahweh is supposed to be Satan, then, then Satan has a father that's even worse. You understand what they're doing here, Sam? You can you can see this, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what Gnostics well, thought about the God of the Old Testament, guys. He's given you straight up facts from the Gnostic demonic sources. Yep. Like so Martian. Using... Right? Yep. Like Martian, so this... the God of the Old Sorry? Testament, was an evil, uh, cruel God. So... Yes. So this is so basically Yahweh to the Gnostics is Satan. That's why the Bible is is evil. That's why the Jews couldn't, sorry, that's why the Muslims couldn't accept it because they can't worship Satan now, can they? So using this revisionist framework, Jesus is not a Jew. We can go back to Wycliffe here. Okay, that's a long story for another day. Okay. Wait, you're telling me Wycliffe? My understanding, he denied Jesus was a Jew. Um, look, I know that's I mean, not the point, but. Yeah, look, I mean, I try to go where the facts take me. Now, lots of people say that, but I mean, I, I'm pretty brutal about a lot of this stuff. I'm pretty blunt. People don't have to wonder what I think. But um, I mean, Wycliffe, Wycliffe made the first translation of the Bible into English, except it probably wasn't the first. That's probably not even true. But that's a story for another day. But okay. Wycliffe also created a Bible that was, as far as I can tell, fairly corrupt and wow. deserved to be thrown in the trash. I mean, fine. If I'm wrong, wow. quote me on that. Find me some evidence. But... 
But anyway, Wycliffe basically, for, I'll give you an example. We've discussed this before. If you go to other languages, like I speak Afrikaans as well. People speak German, Spanish, Italian, Latin, whatever. The book of James is not called the book of James in other languages. It's called the book of Jacob. The exactly. book of Jacobus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wycliffe said, you know what? I don't like them Jews. I don't like me them Jews. I'm going to start changing the names of things to make them less Jewish so that we can we can start to disassociate Jesus from his Jewish origins. Wow. Okay. Nice. And so he called him James and unfortunately the name yeah. stuck when the yeah. when the King James yeah. version came out the word James unfortunately stuck. That's and it. yeah. So Continue, brother. I'm sorry. I need. I wanted clarification for myself because when I use this stuff, I want to make sure I'm representing you accurately because this is new stuff for me. That's why I stop you. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Yeah. So, so there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot more to the story. I need to dig into Wycliffe at some point and Tyndale and and Martin Luther. Okay. I'm actually planning to do a series on Luther, which I'm going to call Luther. Yeah, um, I love it. Praise the Lord, guys. I gave you a link to his channel. Go there, subscribe, watch his stuff because he's going to be uploading no new stuff. That's going to take a long time before you can share it on my channel because he's starting from the beginning with me here. He's already gone beyond this on his channel. So go there and support the brother. Yeah. So, I mean, I know this. Look, I understand if I do a series on Martin Luther, it's not going to go down well. Look, it's not like I'm just trying to bring down Christianity, but I'm, I'm, I've read a lot about Martin Luther. And to be quite blunt, what I found, I'm going to be polite here, but my honest appraisal of Luther is that he was pond scum. And that's being very generous. Glory to God. And, you're, and by the way, so people don't know, this is not a Catholic or an Orthodox saying this. He's not Catholic. He's not Orthodox. But from a study of Luther, he sees how evil and demented Luther is. So just people know that you're not saying it as a Catholic who obviously will hate Luther. Yeah, no, clearly. I mean, I mean, I was look, you know, what I find very odd is that that many people like, well, you know, I, I'm just a Christian. I don't want to really tell people on YouTube what, what denomination I am because you know, I, I just want to keep it keep it uh, secret. Yes. You know, I just want to keep it neutral. And look, guys, I was raised Protestant. I was raised in the Anglican Church. So, which, you know, so I, I've said this openly on multiple channels. I don't hide it. You don't have to wonder if I'm a Jehovah's Witness or if I'm a uh, uh, if I'm a if I'm a strict Brianist who follows the. Uh, and in case you are wondering, um, okay, you know, if if I if I follow the the um, the People's Front of Judea or the Judean People's Front. You know, I support the people's front of Judea, just so you know. And, um, you know, so look, I've, I've been very blunt about it, very open about it. But also I'm, I'm doing research, I'm reading, and I'm and I'm finding things that I just, I'm like, what the hell's going on here? So, yeah. Okay, moving on. So the God of the Old Testament of Abraham and Moses, whom we call Yahweh, is in the Islamic sense and in the sense of these Gnostics, Satan. Okay, that's why they are, they believe Christians are evil. And understand they really believe you are evil. And to destroy you, is for them good. Do understand that. Okay, so to finish off, Maimonides. I'll finish here, okay? Maimonides, Abraham the Sabaean. So Maimonides, now everyone says Maimonides was Satan himself come down to earth wearing a yamulka or something, okay? But it is well known that the patriarch Abraham, so he's one of the greatest sages. He's a Middle Eastern, Middle yeah. Ages sage of Judaism. He's one of the greatest, considered one of the greatest patriarchs of Judaism, greatest rabbis ever to live, very great scholar. So it is well known that the patriarch Abraham was brought up in the religion and opinion of the Sabaeans. We opened with the Sabaeans. We've been discussing them somewhat. Ignoble remnants of the nations left in remote corners of the earth, like the savage Turks in the extreme north. Hold on. So there's a connection with the Sabaeans and the Turks and their symbolism, the moon and the crescent star. Okay, great. And the Indians in the extreme south. Okay, so there's a connection with Hinduism, maybe. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe we'll find one if we look. These are remnant Sabaeans who once filled the earth. And wow. Abraham was a Sabaean. Yes, Sam? Wow. So Maimonides, a medieval rabbi, considered one of the greatest rabbis who ever lived, from Moses to Moses, because his name is Moses Maimonides, who wrote the 13 Articles of Faith. He's saying not only was Abraham reared in the religion of the Sabians, but that the Turks and the Indians have Sabian roots. What he says wow. now i mean there you go you know this is odd this is very interesting i mean we've been wow. seeing on the coins these connections we've been seeing historically there's these connections on the flags on the symbols wow. okay so maybe maybe there's something to it who knows right in their writings noah was rebuked and imprisoned because he worshiped god 
and with many other accounts about him, the Sabaeans contend that Seth differed from his father Adam as regards the worship of the moon. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Seth. Mm. Now we start getting into Sethian Gnosticism. Yeah. Now we start getting into... Yes, Sam? No, I'm saying, yeah, I'm agreeing with you. I'm apologizing. Yeah, Sethian, yeah. 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 So brother, Seth yeah. has a particular place in the Islamic story, in the Islamic narrative, as does Enoch. Okay, those two are connected. And then, of course, you go into Gnosticism, you go into occultism, and you start to look at Seth and Enoch a little differently. And then you start to get into Hermeticism and so on. And these are, that's odd. So Seth apparently worshipped the moon, but Adam didn't. So Seth, okay, well, whatever, fine. When Abraham, the pillar, okay, now we're back to pillars. Abraham was called the pillar of the world. When he appeared, he became convinced that there's a spiritual divine being, which is not a body, nor a force residing in a body. In other words, not in a statue. Okay, because the statue is the body of the of the localized idol, idol, I, God, the God idol. The great book on the subject is the book on the Nabataean. Oh, now it's linked to Nabatea to Petra. Oh my golly, isn't Nabatea. that fascinating? Mm. Converging book, research of Dan Gibson and others. Mm. Go ahead. Oh yeah, that, that's this. That's just sheer coincidence, of course. The great book on this subject is the book on the Nabataean agriculture, translated by Ibn Washia. I should explain why the Sabaeans had their religious doctrines written in a work on agriculture. The book is full of the absurdities of idolatrous people. And with these things, to which the minds of the multitude easily turn and adhere perseveringly, it speaks of talismans, the means of directing the influence of the stars, of mm. witchcraft, of spirits like jinns, and demons that dwell in the wilderness. There also occur in this book great absurdities which are ridiculous in the eyes of intelligent people. Your thoughts on that so far? So you're telling me Maimonides, here is Maimonides, medieval rabbi. He saw the clear connections. And by the way, the Turks, I wasn't talking about pre, he, I just want to be clear. Yes, the Mongols that came and the Ottoman Empire, I wasn't saying that the original Turkey, inhabitants of Turkey, Turkey were Christian. So yes, thank you for that correction. So, but Maimonides is seeing clearly that, here you have the Sabian influence that has permeated Islam as well as the Indian religion. A religion that takes biblical characters and bastardizes their stories because Seth wants to worship the moon and Adam doesn't want to worship the moon. And he saw these connections with Islam and even the Hindu religion. Yes. And the Turks. We're going to get into the Turks as well, but there's definitely a connection. There's no doubt. Okay. So I want to mention something. Someone just dropped something. Space Ghost Rocket said, I always wondered why the KKK called blacks a coon. And he says, now it makes sense. If they're Muslims, then they were talking about the Mushrikun. And remember, Sam, you mentioned last week that blacks in South Africa, I mean, growing up, coming from South Africa, blacks were called Kaffirs. Kaffirs, yeah. okay? Sure. This was a common term in South Africa. But, but notice, coon, Mushrikun. Oh, so this young man made that connection. So That's they called Kuhn. Hey, good connection, brother. Who made that connection? Yeah. That is very it? interesting. That actually makes sense to me. I mean, I can't see a reason to reject it. Yeah, so Kuhn from Mushri Kuhn. So they're Kuhns because the KKK is originally an Islamic, Islamically based <clears throat> racist group. Good yep. connection, brother. Man. That's interesting. That is some solid stuff. That could, yeah. I mean, I can't see a reason to reject it. I, I see no reason to say, well, no, you know. Glory okay, so... I'll briefly speak about Abraham, the pillar of the world and the pillars. Okay, we'll talk about this because Islam wants to reject, has gone against all the Ten Commandments and everything, all the principles of the ethics of the Bible. Abraham and the pillars Yahweh hates. In Genesis, Abraham and his descendants worship in a manner that includes mention of trees and pillars. This is from the book Israelite Religions, an Archaeological and Biblical Survey. In Deuteronomy, Deuteroscopy 16, 21 to 22, you shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. You shall not set up a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. Other versions go, and do not set up holy stone pillars which the Lord your God hates. Absolutely. Abraham is told to stay away from trees and pillars. This is why these other religions had pillars and why Islam suddenly starts to adopt these ideas of Hanif, the upright pillar. And Are if you, you go into the Kaaba, you'll find pillars inside the did Kaaba. You, 
I, I wanted to. Did you remember when he started? He showed you all those pictures that they found of pillars. Some were little tilted. Some were upright pillars all over Arabia. Did you guys make the connection? All of these pillars that were found in Arabia that predate even time of Christ and predate Muhammad. Are you making the connection? The pillars that were used by the pagans to worship gods and goddesses that the Bible condemned and warned true believers to stay away from. Are you making the connection? That's why he started with the pictures. He's trying to tie it in. Glory to God. Yeah, and interesting. Someone says here, Jesus was scourged at the pillar and hung on a tree. And if you go to the Kaaba originally, if you look at the Islamic sources, there were paintings of trees in the Kaaba. We're going to look at that in the future, but but yeah. Okay, so that's a real odd, weird, but that's an oddity. In the book Genesis and Exodus, then they speak of if patriarchal religion corresponds to some kind of historical reality, then presumably this is either some form of a genuinely ancient pre Yahwistic religion or something that was an unorthodox strand within Yahwistic religion. So basically, they say so, so either this weirdness, so in other words, within the Jewish religion, okay, there was either a genuinely ancient pre Yahwistic religion or it was something heretical that formed yeah. okay the difficulty with the latter suggestion that this was an unorthodox strand within the Yahwistic religion prior to so is that this this paganism that that we're, we're trying to discuss here this 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 difficulty with the latter suggestion is precisely the complete lack of that holiness and exclusiveness which is one of the most fundamental characteristics of Yahwism so in other words could Abraham have been worshipping a genuine religion but this religion lacks certain these qualities that are that are clear within the worship of Yahweh the morality and a certain a certain holiness they mentioned which is associated with Yahweh so was this a genuine religion really you know was this really his religion and this book says no the book rejects that idea this particular book Genesis and Exodus rejects this idea so I'll stop here last slide okay no. glory to God let me sum up what this quote is saying brother so you, you have one more slide I'm sorry I thought that's why I go on. No, please, please, please. Let's, yeah. We can finish here. We can finish here and go to the next slide. No, so if you wanted one second, I want to catch, catch this stuff. And I, I'm not trying to cut into your time. This stuff is phenomenal. Okay. And I'm going to repeat it so people get the point. Here's a source that says that you'll find certain strands within Israelite people. And this is all throughout the Old Testament. If you read your Old Testament, what is God constantly doing? Rebuking his people for engaging in the practices of the pagans, worshiping gods and goddesses, worshiping at groves and trees, erecting sacred pillars and committing orgies as acts of worship. And God is condemning that because his people are littered with that pagan influence. So what the source is saying is these practices may have been pre yahwistic meaning these were the practices adopted, let's say, by Abraham before he came to know Yahweh, because these were the practices prevalent among the pagans. And then later on, because the Israelites interacted with these pagans, they continued being influenced by these practices that were long rejected by their father and condemned by Yahweh because these practices are unholy and contrary to the purity of Yahweh. That's what it's saying. Thank you. You said it much better than I could. <laughs> you explained oh, it way quoting, better than so I, I just did. want to bring it out. I want to make it because I keep telling people, learn, ask the Spirit to help you understand. When you understand, then you can share like he is because you got to take this stuff and make it go viral. So, brother... If you want to go to your final slide, go ahead. Okay, so where are we going to go next time? Okay, so we're going to talk about Ur. We're going to do some historical stuff. So basically speaking, actually, no, this is not that important, but I'll just briefly. So next time we're going to talk about Ur. Where did Abraham come from, Iraq or Turkey? Okay, yeah. if you ask me, Turkey, not Iraq. Okay, mm -hmm. beyond the Euphrates, we're going to talk about that. But also briefly, we're going to look at upright pillars, Gebekli Tepe, because we're going to start to find this crazy connection with Islam, the moon, and pillars, and Sirius, and stars, and star gods, and the, and also the world's oldest. Now, they believe that Abraham, short version, Abraham was like, he worshipped the oldest religion, the first god, the original god. Okay, mm -hmm. what is the world's oldest, oldest archaeological site? Well, Gobekli Tepe. What's the and oldest what? site? Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Oh, that's the oldest site, they believe? Uh, well, there's one that's been found in this region that happens to be older than Gobekli Tepe unearthed in Turkey. But the whole point is that the whole idea of, of Abraham coming from, from, from south in Iraq, right, 
was a later thing that that is that that comes from the 30s prior to that scholars based on biblical evidence and etc cetera, etc cetera, all believed it came from the north from this area here turkey this area gebekli tepe is walking distance from where abraham lived mm, amazing walking distance sam wow and what we're going to start yeah sorry can you give me like a foretaste what was the god worship there the moon Fortis, god what, come next week Seriously. oh so Hold on, you just you made my hair stand on my. Uh, I don't have hair on my head. This is believed to be the oldest site, and Abraham lived walking distance from it. Yes, and the world, oldest the temple. oldest god worshipped in this area, which is the oldest god that we have as far as recorded evidence, is the moon god. So you're telling me even back then, in one of these oldest sites, if not the oldest sites where Abraham lived, walking distance from, they worshipped the moon. The star god. The, in, serious, the star god. But there's a link to the moon here. Don't worry. It's part of the same pantheon. It's the child of the moon. Yeah, because if you're worshipping the the stars, you're worshipping the sun and the moon. So there you it's go. The, the pantheon, yeah. It's the, it's the trinity. It's the, the star, sun, moon. Yeah. There you go, guys. So moon worship, astral worship, the worship of sun and moon and stars go way back and that has been a thorn in the side. And by the way, just to show you how accurate your Bible is, how supernatural your Bible is, if you read Deuteronomy, if you go to Deuteronomy 29 and you read verses 24 to 27, and you read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19 to 20, Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 3, you'll see there God says that as punishment for the nations for wanting to oppose God at the Tower of Babel, he handed them over to the worship of the sun and moon and stars. So archaeological discoveries are confirming what Bible has said about the ancient peoples. Fantastically said. It's, this is fantastic corroboration. I mean, really, it's great. So finally, I just we will come to this. There's so much. I've got 180 slides, more or less. Okay, I just want to show you this. The word Islam, our final slide, I'll end off here so we can just talk a little bit about the future. So everyone tells you, you know, the root of the word Islam right, is Sillam. Yeah. Okay? And they will tell you, Sillam comes from Salam Alaikum. Salam means peace. Salami okay? Alaikum. I like Salami. Well, notice, I want you to notice, this is a 9,000-year-old shrine in Jordan. It happens to have graven idols. Well, what are these idols called, Sam? Can you just tell me what that is? Sillam. Oh, yeah. Sillam, Sillam. That's right. Salam. Is that the root of the word Islam? Islam yes. is a religion that's named something like that? Yes, yeah, Salam. And here it's a term used for these images and how 9,000-year-old shrines called Salam? Graven idols, graven idols. You shall not make unto yourself graven idols. You have nothing to do with Islam, Lloyd. You're nothing confusing yourself the facts. You've, you've fried your brain. Man, dude. Yeah, so, so it turns out that the early, and when you look at the meaning, you know, Islam, you know, the, the, it comes from salam means peace, and salam means submission, and salami, which is nice food, okay? But, you know, but, but salam, when you look at the word salam, the earliest use of it, it is for the star god. The earliest use of the, of the root salam is for the star god shalim. Oh, shalim. Oh, my goodness. This is mind-blowing. And a lot of people don't know the word seen in Arabic would correspond to sheen in the Hebrew or Aramaic. So there's a connection there, too. Oh, Lloyd. So that's I me, think. Sam. So what did you learn today? Uh, I well, learned that. There'll be, there'll be a test. There's going to be an exam after this. Well, I learned that you're a dangerous man. And thank Jesus Christ that he's preserving your life, may preserve you and your family. And you're in a safe country by the grace of God and extend your earthly life. Because if the Muslims find you, you're going to be <clears throat> experiencing the religion of pieces, not peace, but pieces, a piece of you yeah, here. Like I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to claim that I'm, uh, I'm not that guy, but, but I do have a particular set of skills. Uh, praise God. Yes. You're not... <laughs> I like that. Hey, you know, uh, you know, going to make a movie where on the phone with uh, the Saudi Arabian prince. Listen, I have a particular set of skills and I'm after your harem, but not because I'm going to marry them. <laughs> okay. So, yes, that's the whole point, because if by the grace of God, as long as the Lord preserves you for many more years to bless us, if the Muslims, and I pray that never happens, gang up on you and catch you unawares, so you can't do Liam Neeson on them, 
you're going to learn about the religion of pieces, a piece of you here, a piece of you there, a piece of you that, but your life is in the hands of Jesus. So glory to God for you, man. Can't wait for next week. Yeah, no, so thanks. I hope. Yeah. So what is the major takeaway from this, um, Sam? Is this making sense? Am I, so do I sound like a crackpot or am I no, onto something? It's overwhelmingly, massively, mind-blowingly clear. <laughs> Islam. So this has nothing to do with Islam, right? <laughs> yes, nothing to do with Islam. You are hallucinating. You're you're taking too much mushrooms, psychedelic. You're inducing a psychedelic state where you're there with J uh, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, and you're seeing things that don't exist in reality. But what's amazing is you have taken this to a level because, again, let me repeat: in the '90s, Robert Morey made the Moon God theory of Islam popular. I have the book. I'll probably show it in my next live stream. But because it was in its infancy stages, he didn't have this kind of research. Muslims humiliated him, mocked him, laughed at him, and discredited him. You can watch the debates on YouTube. Robert Morey, Jamal Badawi Shabrali, the moon god. And so people, even Christians, turned against him. Christians wow. started discrediting him. I'm not lying. Wow. They said, this man is a joke. His scholarship is pathetic. You can't Very trust well. him. He's a disgrace to Christianity. So what you did was, the Lord Jesus and his love for his servants, the Lord moved you to now vindicate, Maury, because your research is massive and overwhelming. So if someone wants to blindly follow Islam, then he's going to say it's all lies. But as far as refuting it, it can't be done because these are facts. Well, so this is only going to mount. The evidence is only going to mount. I mean, this is the first episode. I'm just putting down some basic facts, right? Glory to God. So you are you have blessed the church, but you also vindicated Robert Maury, and I'm thankful for that. Because when Robert Morey came up with that theory, and I saw how Shibri Ali, there's a debate I want you to watch, Lloyd, to prepare you for next week. It's Shibri Ali, Robert Morey. You just put in Shibri Ali, Robert Morey. Shibri Ali quoted some of the sources that Morey quoted, like Wendell Phillips. I know about Wendell Phillips because Shib uh, Morey mentioned him in his book. He then tried to give the impression that Morey misquoted, and Morey was discredited and laughed at. No one took him seriously anymore. So maybe that, if you watch that debate, that will probably motivate you to go even harder to show that the Muslims were lying and Maury was right. So, so the Lord of God. No, and by the way, his link, the link to his YouTube channel, I pinned it and it's in the description box. You need to subscribe to the channel, watch his latest stuff and support him prayerfully and financially to do this work for the glory of Christ. So glory well, to God. Thank you. So guys, I hope that was interesting and eye-opening. I hope I didn't go too fast. People tell me I'm like a fire hose, trying to drink from a fire hose. No. So phenomenal. phenomenal. It's recorded. They can go back and rewatch. So, brethren, next week, God willing, I'll be in another state if the Lord wills. And we're going to be same bat time, same bat channel Thursday at this time, God willing. So you mark it down. Unless something happens, it will be Thursdays if the Lord wills. And so pray for him. Go to his YouTube channel. Subscribe. Watch his stuff and prayerfully consider supporting him financially for the work of the Lord. And I will be live in about an hour and 40 minutes, God willing, on another topic not related to this. So, brother, any final words? Oh, no, that's it. So, guys, um, yeah, this has been heavily researched. It took me months to write and research. I mean, it was it was a mountain of effort. It didn't happen overnight. I've, I've checked and double-checked as much as I can. Some of the evidence, I mean, look, there's always the risk of a mistake. I mean, I do work very hard to avoid those. But no one has come back to me and disproven me. And, yeah, I mean, look, many of these things, there's room to explore and expand upon any of these topics. So there's plenty of room to dig deeper and find more evidence. To, you know. So yeah, please use this material, confront Muslims with it, talk about it, say, hey, look, let's have an honest discussion about the history, the archaeology. The archaeology doesn't lie. Glory to God. And what you said was important. I'm going to leave it with this. And guys, don't forget, go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, watch his stuff, share it with others, invite him to your channels like Full Armor Apologetics. You invite people, get in contact with them, bring him to your channel and prayerfully consider supporting financially. And I just want to Echo what he said. The more we engage in discussion, the more we research, the more facts we'll uncover and the more clear the evidence. Because what did I say? Maury was one of the first that I'm aware mentioned Allah is the moon god, but he didn't have this amount of research. So now look, fast forward. That was in the 90s. We're now in 2023. Here comes Lloyd. Mountain of evidence that's overwhelming that Maury would have been rejoicing and singing hallelujah if he had access to only God knows if the Lord tarries, does it come in our lifetime, what another 20 years of research will do. Islam is over. Islam is about to be destroyed. In the age of in the internet, Islam is done away with. And yet 
every archaeological inscription we find or textual manuscript, it only reinforces and confirms the Bible is true and the God of the Bible is real and Jesus is Lord and he's alive. So glory to God for that, brother. We love you. And Thank we'll you. do it again next Thursday, God willing, but from another state because I'm traveling. But I still want to do this next week, God willing. Well, thanks. Thank you, Sam. Much appreciated. And thank you for all the input, the feedback, the corroboration. I mean, it really makes a difference, you know, that that yeah. you actually, you have a critical mind, you challenge things and you're going, hey, this actually makes sense and you're corroborating it. Superb, man. I just want to remember it. That's the thing. Your stuff is superb. I want to remember it. So it's going to take me a while. So, but thank you, brother, your service. I wanted to give you a copy then so you can read it so that, you know. Oh, it'd be nice if you can, because I want to remember these facts. I really do. Because I promise you, I'll start using them and demolishing people in debate. But I thank God yeah, no. for your blessing to me. Your blessing That's to 181 church. slides. So, yeah. I don't think <laughs> I'm going to just have some, do no ministry for a month and just watch your slides. Good yeah. God. So, yeah, hopefully it was logical and it, you know, everything tied together. I wasn't just meandering wildly. It, it actually oh, it made did. logical sense. My oh, brother did. I'm telling you, the flow was excellent. So, you know, I, I know you're sensitive. You want people to understand it. They did. It flowed beautifully. God has blessed you. You're a good communicator. And you know how to tie it in. May God perfect those gifts in you and the gifts he's given me. We glorify Jesus and never bring any attention to ourselves. And we had about 450 people watching you. That's a lot for me. I'm not like David Wood or Apostate Prophet or Christian Prince. They get over a thousand. May our numbers increase in your child mind for the glory of Christ. But amazing stuff, brother. No, so, so guys, yeah, I mean, look, we, we need to, let, Muslims need to understand the source of their beliefs are pagan. It and is. We, we offer hell. something better. Our beliefs, we, we, we stand on something better. We offer them something better. We need to show Amen. them, look, you know, you've rejected this in favor of this. I mean, you know, so yeah, Amen. let them know. It's Islam's not only pagan, it's from the pit of hell. And there is a better way. The only way, Jesus Christ, the Lord, who said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And may the Lord continue to shine through Lloyd. I pray he does that for me and all of you. Support one another, pray for one another, go to his channel and make him go viral. Lord willing, I'll see you in an hour. On another topic, destroying Islam, Christ is risen, risen indeed, and Muhammad is dead and buried in hell. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, guys. Good night.